Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen loses it over me cooking breakfast that wasn't good enough for her. I'm 32, male. My fiance, who's 31, was working from home this morning. I asked her if she would like some bacon and an egg sandwich, and she said yes. She does prefer mayo on both sides of the toast when she has this, but as I prepared it all, I forgot. As soon as I said it in front of her, I remembered and said, Hold on, I forgot the mayo. I'll go put it on real quick. To which she replied, Forget it, it's ruined now. I got upset by this comment as it made me feel as if I had somehow ruined breakfast, so I tried to explain that it was an easy remedy and the sandwich was most definitely not ruined. She told me to just forget it again, so I went back into the kitchen, finished making my own sandwich and sat down. She came in and started to talk about how she thought it would be a fried egg, which again just felt like she was complaining about nothing, as I never said that I would be frying them, just stated bacon and an egg sandwich. When I got upset that she seemed to still just be complaining, she basically told me that I was wrong. She wasn't complaining, she was just making comments, and I was the jerk for being upset since she didn't say anything wrong. Am I the jerk? Edit. I scrambled the eggs in a bowl with some seasoning and a bit of milk, put it in the bacon grease, and waited until it was cooked on the bottom. Flip the egg like a pancake and cook the other side. Cut it in half and put it on the toast like a sandwich. Not the jerk. Here's a great solution though. Never make her anything ever again. Or dump her. That's another good option. She sounds entitled and ungrateful. The fact that she tried to walk back and twist what she had said is the icing on the cake. I wasn't complaining when I said forget it, it's ruined. I was just making a neutral comment. That's gaslighting and she shouldn't be treating you like that. Am I the jerk for not telling my roommate I own the house? Brief backstory. About a year ago, my last remaining grandparent passed and my father inherited all assets, including a house. I had been saving for a nice down payment, at least 50%, so I could have a lower mortgage payment each month, thus allowing me to save money for travel. When my father inherited this house, which he had no interest in moving into yet, he offered to sell it to me for slightly below market rate, with the caveat that he and my stepmother could eventually move into the basement apartment. I agreed because they're both incredible people who are not at all invasive and would give me my privacy if they lived there. So I paid a 60% down payment, financed the rest, and moved in. Present day. About six months ago, I started considering renting out the finished basement apartment. It has two bedrooms, one bathroom, a living room, and a small kitchenette. A friend of mine said his brother was moving to my city and needed a place. He's a brand new teacher and doesn't make great money, so he needed a place that wasn't expensive. I offered to let him rent my basement for way less than market rate, $650, which would include utilities. He readily accepted and signed a year-long lease. Well, a few days ago, he asked if he could start paying the landlord directly instead of giving me rent money each month. I was under the impression my friend had told him that I own the house, so I was confused and I told him we don't have a landlord and that I'm the owner. He got very upset and screamed at me for lying for over six months and taking advantage of him by making him pay so much in rent. For the record, an apartment similar to the one in my house would be well over twice what he's paying me, closer to three times for something this nice. He asked how much of my mortgage he's covering, and I said, why does that matter? You're getting a nice, quiet place to live, access to a full kitchen and laundry room, and you're paying an amount that you can afford. My personal finances aren't really a factor here. He stormed out of the room and slammed the basement door. He's still not speaking to me. I asked a few other friends and some family members, and most said I'm wrong for having him cover my mortgage payments. Only a few say I'm in the right. So, am I the jerk for having my roommate cover $650 of my $775 per month mortgage? He has a lease, so I won't be evicting him over this alone. If he does any damage or becomes hostile, I'll look at the eviction process. But for now, he will remain, unless he chooses to break the lease, which I'd allow him to do if he wants to. He also didn't bother to read the lease before signing. The lease clearly states that I'm the homeowner. I didn't trick him or keep the info from him. He simply didn't read what he was signing. I didn't get the house for almost free as some people choose to believe. My father sold it to me for about 75% of its value, more or less as an advance on rent he and my stepmother will pay when they move in here in a few years. We already agreed they won't pay monthly rent, but will contribute to utilities and groceries at that time. I also made a 60% down payment, so I have quite a bit invested, as well as paying about $1,500 a month out of pocket for taxes, insurance, maintenance, utilities, etc. What do they think people do when they rent? They cover the landlord's mortgage payment. You're definitely not the jerk, and quite honestly, do not renew the lease with this person. How entitled can someone be? 
I rented an Airbnb for a few months when I was new to the area. More precisely, I rented a bedroom. Yes, I had access to the kitchen, shared bathroom with whoever else were guests, shared laundry room and pool, but still, bedroom. For more than you're charging for a finished basement apartment. It sounds like your renter is going to get sticker shock when he moves out. Tell everyone who thinks you're ripping this guy off to check the market rate for the area and buzz off. Were you supposed to let him stay for free? Again, not the jerk, but I think I'd start looking for smarter friends. Not the jerk. The question isn't the mortgage, it's fair market rate for what he's getting. I get the shock he's feeling, but he's not entitled to free housing just because you're friends. Goodness, I hate defending a landlord. Makes me feel dirty. If you feel dirty for defending a landlord who did nothing wrong, you might want to talk to someone about that. Am I the jerk for telling my brother's fiance that we don't owe her a family? I'm female, 25. My stepbrother, Nico, who's 29, has recently got engaged to a woman called Jenny after dating for two years. We all tried to welcome Jenny, especially knowing that she grew up in the foster care system and didn't have family. We tried to get to know her, but she seemed to want an instant, intimate connection rather than building one. Me and my younger stepsister, Chelsea, who's 22, bore the brunt of her neediness, but our parents have also expressed concerns. Since she met us, she's been trying to insert herself into pictures, family disputes, and social events. She has no boundaries. We've all talked to Nico about it many times, even sitting him down as a family, and he keeps saying he'll talk to her about it, but nothing changes, and it's got worse since the engagement. She tried to make me her maid of honor, demanded my mother throw her a bridal shower, started calling my parents mom and dad, even though they asked her not to, and reached out to distant family members that we don't even talk to to tell them about the engagement. Last week, we were all, Chelsea, Nico, me, and our parents, staying in our parents' place. Jenny, Nico, and my boyfriend were the only ones not up yet, and the rest of us were in the kitchen. Chelsea, my mom, and I were talking about taking a weekend trip. Jenny came in, having overheard us, saying it sounded like fun, and proceeded to invite herself along. I was pretty annoyed by this, and said she couldn't just invite herself. Jenny asked why wouldn't she be invited, and I said because marrying Nico doesn't give you a blanket invite to every single thing our family does. Jenny got upset and said she would really like to be included in our family, since it was the only one she knows and she doesn't have a proper family. I said I know that and we all sympathize, but that doesn't mean we owe you a new one. The whole room was silent and Jenny got up and went back upstairs. She didn't come out the rest of the day, but Nico came down to chew me out over what I had said. Our parents defended me, saying he had an opportunity to talk to Jenny, but he didn't. He and Jenny left the same day, and he's now only keeping low-level contact with everyone. When I spoke to him about it since, he just said that I went way too low with what I said to Jenny, and that I've set her back mentally, and that she's really down. I do feel bad, but I also feel like Jenny has been overstepping. We're all open to a relationship with her. We all have good relationships with partners in the family, but she never really made a genuine effort to build relationships with us. She just decided that she was entitled to them, which I think isn't fair. I don't know if I should reach out to Nico or Jenny and apologize, which I will if I've really messed up here. I don't want to be the reason Nico stops talking to us. I just feel like he dropped the ball by letting it get to this point. Edit. Okay, I'm adding this because I thought it was implied, but maybe not. We do push back when Jenny is being intrusive. I can't count how many times I've said, Jenny, I'm not comfortable talking about my love life, therapy, medication, etc. It's really personal. Can we just change the subject? We move on from the conversation, but the next time I talk to her, it's back to square one. Same with my parents. They politely ask her not to call them mom and dad, and she stops for the duration of that conversation and then starts again next time. We've never had a more in-depth conversation with her. We offered, and Nico said no, he would talk to her. Edit 2. For everyone saying I should consider Jenny family because she's engaged to Nico, that isn't what I meant with that comment. I commented this elsewhere, but I'm copying it because it gets the point across. I never said or meant that she isn't part of the family. I guess what I meant with this was, you can't parachute yourself in and expect us to be the family you deserve. Because the family every person deserves is the one with their mom and their dad, and it's happy and it's from birth, and you don't have to do anything to earn it. Sadly, not everyone gets that. I know I didn't. And I know how much it must suck for her to feel like she has to work for what other people got for free. I have a crappy biological dad, so I kind of know. You think, why do I have to be good and clever and kind and a million other things to have a good family, while all anyone else has to do is just be born, and it's the worst. But when you come into a family that already exists, that's the way it is. They learn to love you, and it takes time. My stepdad didn't love me the second he met me, or love me just because he loved my mom. 
He got to know me and figured out who I was as a person, and he loved me for me. We wanted to have that opportunity with Jenny, and maybe that doesn't feel good enough for her, and I guess it's not really fair that she doesn't have the other kind of unconditional love, but I don't think that's up to us or anyone to fix. That's just my view. Well, Jenny was just going to keep pushing until someone pushed back, so this moment was more or less inevitable. You name the elephant in the room, Jenny's neediness, which your whole family has noticed. I don't know whether Nico failed to talk to her in private or whether he did and she failed to heed his warnings. I also don't know if getting to join what she perceived as a close-knit family is a large part of what makes Nico attractive to her. But I do know that your comment stung deeply and Jenny won't stop feeling it for a long time. It's not impossible that this precipitates a breakup between Nico and Jenny, and if it does, it's highly likely that the blame is going to come your way, so an apology is in your strategic interest, regardless of whether your comment was justified or not. I think my final vote is going to be everyone sucks here, Jenny for being pushy, Nico for not warning her, and you for saying something really wounding. No jerks here. I can't blame you for snapping, and I can't blame Jenny for wanting a close family. Growing up the way she did can result in an intense longing for connection and safety and a lack of proper communication skills. She shouldn't insert herself in everyone's business like that, but she also seems to not understand why. I hope she and your brother can work through that together. On the other hand, I completely understand that it feels very invasive if someone does this to you, even if you understand where they're coming from. The way you said it was a bit harsh, but I assume tension has been building up over time. I do think it's good to talk it out with her once all the emotions have settled and I hope your brother can facilitate the process. She needs to learn the nuance of being welcome, but not overstepping boundaries, and it not being a sign of people not caring about you. I don't know. I kind of think you are the jerk, and your family is too. Like where I come from, when you marry in, you're family. You said she didn't make an effort to know you, but it sounds like she's making lots of effort to know you. She's trying to spend time with you. She's asking you questions about yourself, etc., but she's not good at it. So maybe since you see she would like to be more involved and included, you could try to get to know her instead of telling your brother to put her in her place. Is there any reason you all want to keep her at arm's length, or do you just suck? Am I the jerk for telling my son's wife that his ex is in the family and has been here longer than she has? My son was dating Sabrina. They started in high school and broke up when they were in college. It was a long relationship, and I became really close to her. She is, in my eyes, our daughter. Her family are awful people, and she sees us as her parental figures. She even is planning to have my husband walk her down the aisle when she gets married. Now when they broke up, it was only their relationship. We didn't drop her since she is our kid at this point. My son wasn't happy, but he moved on, so she gets invited to family events and has for years. My son, who's now 27, is married to Bethany, and she is a nice person. We never clicked. We don't have much in common, and they live two hours away, so it's hard to plan stuff to get to know her more. Really, I'm sure it will grow in time. Now, we had a picnic and all the family members were invited, so Sabrina was there as normal and I thought the night was nice. Bethany came up to me at the end of the night and expressed that she's uncomfortable with her husband's ex being everywhere and if I couldn't invite her for family stuff. I told her no and that Sabrina is part of the family and has been part of the family longer than she has. If there was actually a valid reason, like if she were rude, then I would consider it, but she's done nothing. She left and my son called me and called me names for picking her over my now real family. Am I the jerk? My husband thinks that she's crazy, but I know we can be biased. Edit. Okay, I'll make this clear. She may not be my kid by blood, but everything else, she is my daughter and has been for about 10 years. Also, Sabrina is engaged, so no, she doesn't want to get back with my son, and I don't want them to either. Yes, I have invited Bethany to do stuff with me. It's always been a no. I would be saying that I don't see her as family if I disinvite her to family events she's been coming to for 10 years. This is asking me to choose between two kids. I will not disown one. No jerks here. You think of Sabrina as your own kid. She's invited to things because you became her surrogate family. Bethany is not a jerk for being upset that someone her husband once loved is invited to all of your family events. I would also be upset if my husband's ex was accepted into his family while I'm still struggling to feel like I'm part of the family. Sorry, but I think you're the jerk. OP tries to intentionally leave out info. She was vague about the length of the relationship her son had with this girl and what her family did to be so horrible. But if you sift through the story, the son is now 27, so Sabrina is also about 27. OP has considered her a daughter for 10 years? It was a long relationship and they broke up in college? What does that mean? They started dating at 17 and then they broke up at 18? 
OP doesn't tell us, and I'm guessing that's on purpose. Why? Because having some girl that your son dated for such a short period still hanging around 10 years later makes you look like the crazy person that you actually are. Son was against this from the beginning. She's not the daughter, but it sure sounds like OP wishes she had a daughter instead of a son. She now has an actual daughter-in-law who OP admits she doesn't have much in common with, and mom can deny that she wishes her son had married Sabrina all she wants, but her golden treatment of Sabrina mixed with her cold treatment of Bethany paints a different picture. Son probably has to listen to mom say, should have married Sabrina. OP and her husband are the jerk for building this kind of relationship with their son's high school girlfriend. You're the jerk for continuing this kind of relationship after they broke up when their son expressed discomfort over it. You're the jerk for not bringing the same energy for your son's actual wife. Sabrina is you're the jerk for not squashing this after the breakup. 20 bucks says mom tried to get Sabrina invited to her son's wedding. Shame on OP. I hope this son goes no contact. My family's in a similar situation, but in our case, I'm Bethany. I have never and will never ask my mother-in-law to stop seeing our version of Sabrina. I understand that they have a bond and it means a lot to them to see each other on holidays. But we deliberately don't see mother-in-law very often anymore. Every time we are around, at group events or just us visits, my mother-in-law brings up how amazing his ex is. She tells everyone who will listen that she wishes her son and his ex had worked things out because she doesn't like me as much. Bethany will never forget your blatant favoritism. Your son will never forget it either. I'm not saying that Sabrina needs to be uninvited to events. I'm saying you need to put in more effort to make Bethany feel like her emotions matter to you at all. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Exes are exes for a reason. When will parents and other family members learn to start respecting that? Careful now, Karen. We might get comments from people who are upset at you for saying that. Good. More comments are better for the algorithm. Do it. Am I the jerk for saying parents should take screaming babies to the restroom or outside until they calm down? I, 38 male, have been seeing this woman who's 35 female for a few months. She has three kids who are 8, 10, and 15, and I have none by choice, but I would love to be a stepdad one day. I'm the oldest of four boys, and my youngest brother is 18 years younger than me. I've been around kids since I was six years old. My brothers have a combined six kids now. This comes into play later. We've been doing great for the duration of our relationship. No arguments or anything. We've been doing family activities together. Everything's been great. So we're at dinner Friday night, and there's a table of eight adults and one baby. The baby, who's about two years old, is just relentlessly screaming for like 15 minutes straight. All gas, no brakes. The parents are acting like nothing is going on, completely ignoring it. I say to her, this may be an unpopular opinion, but I think one of those parents should take their baby to the restroom or outside until they calm down. It's kind of inconsiderate of everyone else around them. This sparked something in her soul, and she absolutely lost it. Told me, if you really feel that way, that just makes you a horrible human being and that I was a male Karen for even thinking that. She blames the whole issue on me not having kids and not knowing what it's like, etc. If you knew it could possibly offend me, then why did you even say it? And that she now can't trust me because I might say something out of line to her kids or parents. Yeesh, and you wonder why she's single. We finished up and I took her home, where we sat in the driveway and talked some more. I explained that I've been around kids my entire life, and even though I don't have any of my own, I absolutely know what it's like. I've had to take my youngest brother outside for the same reason multiple times growing up. If I'm at dinner with my family and one of my nieces or nephews starts losing it, I'm the one that takes them out so mom and dad can have a break. That I was just expressing my opinion and it wasn't a big deal if she didn't agree because it would never come into play with her kids' ages. She refused to let it go and stays livid, continues saying mean things until I asked her to get out and drove home. Gutted. Am I the jerk? Update. Yes, I did break it off. We had zero communication until Sunday when I called her and officially ended it. She just said, Seriously? and hung up. I came here for some validation because she really did start to make me feel like I was a jerk for thinking this way. I just wanted to make sure. The restaurant we went to was an upscale Mexican restaurant. She's been a single mom for around five years. To those of you saying there must be more to this story, there's not. We've never had a fight. She has introduced me to her kids and they really like me, invite me over for dinner and game nights. Everything was going well. This was a curveball out of the blue, completely blindsided. How would I react on an airplane? This is hilarious to me. I've been through screaming babies on airplanes probably half a dozen times. Obviously, there's nowhere to go on an airplane. I'm proactive and bring noise-canceling headphones on every flight.
My parents actually told me they stopped going out to restaurants until I was older due to an epic meltdown I had at a restaurant when I was two. They refused to be those parents that let me cry it out while everyone else suffered. Am I the jerk for buying a peanut butter cake even though my boyfriend is allergic? I'm 22, female. My boyfriend, who's 24, always told me he was allergic to peanuts. I don't know where he gets that from because his mom has always said that he isn't. I never wanted to risk giving him any and have an allergic reaction, so I just took his word for it. Yesterday, I went to a bakery before work and bought myself a peanut butter cake to eat after lunch. My boyfriend surprised me at work during my break and wanted us to eat lunch together. I told him okay. After we were done eating, my boyfriend saw the bakery bag with the cake and asked if he could have some. I said no as it was a peanut butter cake and I didn't want him to have an allergic reaction. That's when he got mad at me for buying this even though he's allergic to it. He said I wasn't being respectful. I told him that I bought it because we weren't supposed to see each other until tonight. 6 p.m. so I'd have time to brush my teeth and stuff and that I wasn't planning on eating it in front of him. He said that I shouldn't have bought it at all, no matter when we were supposed to see each other because it was selfish and as his girlfriend, I shouldn't be eating what I know he can't eat. I think it's not fair that I shouldn't eat something that I like because he's allergic to it. Obviously, I don't eat that when I'm home with him, but we weren't supposed to see each other for the whole afternoon, so I thought it would be a good occasion to have a peanut butter cake. Am I the jerk? Maybe it was selfish to buy something that I know he's allergic to. News. Okay, so, I suggested to my boyfriend that we go to a doctor to know the severity of his allergy, but he doesn't want to and accused me of not believing him. So yeah, I don't know what to do anymore. Not the jerk. He needs to grow up. Those are some serious control issues he has. Consider this a red flag and keep an eye out for more. I'm seriously allergic to selfish and I would never expect someone to stop eating it. I'm jealous of the fact they can and I live vicariously. Even if his allergy is real, you were in no way of endangering him. Having a few family members with severe peanut allergies, I understand they're different. OP was respectful of the allergy. She wasn't supposed to see him until later that night. She mentioned in a comment somewhere that she'd have plenty of time to brush her teeth and clean up. And for those talking about extreme cases, I bet this isn't her first time eating peanut butter since being with him. I'm also pretty sure they've kissed after she's eaten peanut butter sometime earlier in the day. She'd know by now if it was that severe. OP has been careful and respectful. Am I the jerk for checking out of parental duties after my wife said I'm not the father? My wife and I have been married for about four years. She brought three kids from previous relationships into the marriage while I have none. They moved into my house after the marriage because I live in a better school district. Obviously, we've had our ups and downs, but overall it's been good until a couple of weeks ago when I woke up and found a large dent running down the entire passenger side of my car. The dent is about hand's width, starts at the front fender, and runs down all the way to the rear tire. I was furious and thought someone sideswept my car as it was parked on the street. I checked our doorbell camera to see if it recorded anything and was surprised to see our 16-year-old daughter sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night and driving off in my car. She returned hours later stumbling into the house. Outside of those two events, the doorbell camera didn't record anything else but a couple of cars passing by that didn't come close to mine. I angrily showed my wife the recording and told her our daughter needs to be punished, but she said that she'll talk to her. I argued that talk isn't enough, which led us to an argument. My wife argued that the new family dynamic has been hard on the kids, while I argued that it doesn't excuse the damage done to my car. I wanted her to agree to ground our daughter from social media and make her get a job to pay for the damage. We argued for hours until she said I don't get a say in any punishment because I'm not her father. That ended the argument and I walked off. Since then, I've checked out of any parental duties. I've been an adult and still make sure the kids are safe and fed, but I haven't done anything a father would do. They had doctor's appointments last week for their checkups because they play sports in school and I refuse to drive them, causing my wife to have to take off work. They start school next week and I've dropped them off ever since they moved in, but I told my wife she'll have to do it this year. She argued she can't because of her work schedule and I answered a mother would figure it out. She called me a child and said to grow up. I think since I'm not her father, I don't have to take on the responsibilities of one, but obviously she disagrees. Am I the jerk? I was angry when I wrote this, so I left out some info. My wife wants me to report it to my insurance as a hit and run. She said that way no one has to pay for it. I argued that I'll have to pay for it in the long run because they'll jack up my rates. I'm not ignoring the kids and I still talk to them daily. I just don't do or make any parental decisions like I stated before. Also, the other day, our son asked me if he should play basketball or football and I told him go ask his mother. She wants you to report it as a hit and run? 
Insurance fraud is a crime. Don't do it. Also, you had better report the theft of your car and the accident to the police. She obviously hit something with it and there's a good chance a camera somewhere recorded your car and it can be traced back to you. Then I think you should separate. Her daughter committed at least three serious crimes. She's put you at risk of being sued and possibly arrested. You can't live in a home where that behavior isn't dealt with. Everyone sucks here. Wife and daughter are jerks for obvious reasons. You're a jerk for not taking this seriously enough. You're playing petty games about basketball and rides to school when there's a criminal in the house and her mother is enabling her. What else is she up to that you don't know about? Not the jerk, but your wife definitely is. What kind of mother is fine with her 16-year-old stealing a car, driving like that, and causing some sort of accident? If I did that, I wouldn't even have a social life until I went off to college. Sorry, but you are beyond dumb for marrying someone with that many kids and none of them are yours. Let me guess, you pay for all or the majority of the bills in the household. Good luck with that. Those kids could burn the house down and she won't say a word. They don't respect you, they just found a sucker to use. It's not about marrying someone who has three kids, it's about this woman in particular being a jerk. Let's not make sweeping generalizations here just because you apparently think all single moms are gold diggers or something. Look, if you want to co-sign with this buffoonery, go ahead. This is a completely bad deal for him. Look at this situation. Basically, it's a no-win situation. He took four people into his home, and instead of making his life easier, they made it worse. Like I said in my earlier post, he was dumb for marrying her, even dumber for letting them all move in. My Karen wife is demanding my daughter share her college fund with her stepsister. I'm married to Ashley. Our girls from previous relationships are both 17. My ex-wife was Sam. She and I were never a great couple, but we were great friends and great parents and co-parents, so we stayed very close after the divorce. I was aware she had started saving for our daughter's future education. We had reached somewhat of a compromise on how to handle that. I did most of the spending on her adolescent activities and extras, so all her extracurricular activities, hobbies, and for the most part, gifts that we shared, while she saved for the future in an effective way. I never knew how much was in the account until two years ago when my ex passed. It was then I learned she had saved a hefty amount and that aside from allowing for her funeral expenses, she had left money for our daughter to use as she saw fit outside of the college money. Ashley and I married seven years ago, and at the time, we had discussed money for the girls, etc. I explained that I was not saving, but my ex-wife was. She had not started anything for her daughter at that point, and her ex was not saving either. So we started to put a little by when we could. But we were never able to save huge chunks at a time. After Sam passed, money became a much larger issue. Ashley was upset to learn my daughter had a considerable amount more than my stepdaughter for college and that she had money to spare. It only became a bigger deal this past May. My daughter told me she had decided to do community college in her mom's hometown so she could be close to her grandparents for a while and could still follow her dreams. Ashley then brought up how some of that money could go to my stepdaughter. I told her no, that it was not our money, and even if she tried to suggest that it would be mine, seen as my daughter is a minor, I pointed out that it would be stealing to just take it away from her, and I had never contributed to that fund directly and it would be taking my ex-wife's money. Ashley went off about Sam putting so much away when she knew our daughter had a stepsister and how she was selfish to make her so much better off than her only sibling. I told her she needed to get over that because Sam only had one kid to think about and it wasn't her job to think about my stepdaughter or even any biological kids I could have had after our divorce. Ashley told me to think about my stepdaughter. I told her my stepdaughter is not entitled to my daughter's money or my ex-wife's money, whichever way she wanted to look at it. She asked how I could be so callous about her daughter's disadvantage. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your ex-wife saved it for your daughter, not the stepdaughter, so she's not entitled to any of it at all. Not the jerk, but your wife sure is. For me, this childish behavior would be a reason to break up. Not the jerk. Sam saved for her daughter, her only daughter. Not for a stranger's kid who she had no responsibility for. Don't punish your daughter by taking away her college fund that her mother set up for her just because your wife doesn't know how to make good financial decisions for her kid. OP, I would never take away from my daughter. I would also never expect Sam to have saved or given money for my stepdaughter. Mostly, I was just questioning my own handling of saying no and staying firm, whether I lack more care or compassion in this matter. Not the jerk, but definitely explain to your daughter that it's her money left by her mother. 
It seems like she has a good idea of what she wants to do with it. Maybe talk to her about financial responsibility and all of that as well. I feel like your current wife might be the type to try and guilt your daughter into giving up some of the money or sharing. OP, I don't believe my wife would go for that. I do believe this might not be over with her and me, but it will change our marriage incredibly if she continues to push for this. My daughter wouldn't share with her stepsister, neither would my stepdaughter. The girls are not close and don't have a sisterly relationship. It's fine, but they are not each other's biggest fans. I also have the kind of relationship with my daughter where she would tell me if someone was trying to pressure her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. We've heard similar stories a few times and I can just never understand the audacity of these Karens. Am I the jerk for taking my wife's side after she screamed at my crazy mother? I, 33 male, am married to my wonderful wife Melody, who's 29, and she's currently pregnant with our first kid together. I have a six-year-old daughter, Tina, whose mother and I split 50-50 custody, so I know for the most part what Melody needs in order to feel supported while she carries our kid. I've been spending lots of time making sure she's comfortable and taking on more of the load at home so she's not doing too much. This is her first kid after all, and it's obviously a lot for her physically and emotionally. My mother and Melody don't get along too well. Mom didn't like my ex either. We broke up because we were headed on different paths, not because of my mother and there's no bad blood. So I think she just doesn't like her because she's dating me for whatever reason. It's weird. She's very nitpicky about Melody, how much she does around the house, how emotional she is. Melody already cries very easily and being pregnant has made her even more sensitive, which is fine. The fact that she wants to be a stay-at-home mom it just seems like nothing Melody does is okay. I do, however, stand up for her and do not just allow my mom to talk down to her. Today, before picking up my daughter from summer camp, Melody went to three different grocery stores to find rotisserie chicken. She's been talking about it since last night and really, really wanted one. She sent me picture messages documenting her quest for the chicken and finally found it. My girl was happy. Rotisserie chicken is also kind of a comfort food for her, like spaghetti, because her mom used to make one of those when she was having a lazy day and didn't feel like cooking. She was planning on serving that with some other basic sides for dinner, perfectly fine with me. My mother came by to see Tina and started telling Melody the chicken is bad for her and she should not be eating that while pregnant. Melody said it's fine. She usually eats healthy and just wants this one thing she's craving. My mom went on about how unhealthy it was and said she needs to eat something else. Melody said no and went to the backyard to FaceTime her family, out of state. When she came back, my mom had thrown out the food and ordered takeout, a salad for Melody and pizza for everyone else. Melody asked where the chicken was and my mother told her she needs to start being a responsible mother and eat correctly for the baby. Melody screamed, What's wrong with you? Why are you always such a jerk to me? She then started crying and called me home. I came back and asked my mother to leave after hearing her story and said she's not to come back until she apologizes for how she treated Melody. My mom went on about how I'm choosing another woman over her, but I just think enough is enough and Melody reached her limit. She apologized to me for blowing up when Tina was in the house, but I told her it's okay, things happen. Tina is okay and I went to find her another chicken before the store closed. My dad thinks I'm right for taking Melody's side, but my brother thinks I should always defend mom, so... Am I the jerk? Edit. Okay, not to be that guy, but I did not expect this to get so much attention. I woke up to so many notifications and I'm going to try to go through as many as I can, but thank you for all of the support. Melody loves all the kind messages from all of you, especially the mamas and soon-to-be mamas who get it, as she put it. 1. My mom claimed it was the seasoning and fat and grease that made the chicken bad for her. It's all BS, but that's what she claimed. I'll talk to my dad first, then have a family meeting. 2. I do plan on having a sit down with both my parents and my brother. I'll talk to my dad first, then have a family meeting. A lot of you asked why I would still want my mom around, and honestly, maybe I'm just weak, but that's my mother. However, if she cannot learn to change and respect my family, then we will just have to go no contact. It's hard, but it is what it is. Melody doesn't even want to completely cut her out, she just wants change as well but I will protect Melody at all costs, and if that means cutting off my mom, then so be it. 3. My ex and I did not break up because of my mother. We had different ideas of where our lives were going. Tina was not planned, and we were already heading towards our separate ways before she was pregnant. We tried to make it work for Tina, but that's not what relationships are about. 
So we split and it's working great. My ex and Melody get along great. Tina is happy and we work through things as one big blended family. My ex and Melody have talked about my mother with each other before and that was when I realized I needed to see a therapist to work through my childhood with a mom like mine. It's a process. I'm working through it as best I can. 4. Some people asked about our culture. We are all black American. So I think it's more of a mom-son thing than a cultural thing. Not the jerk. Glad you went on a hunt for chicken to replace the one that your mother threw away. Great husbanding on your end, OP. What is wrong with your mom, though? My new coworker demands to be called Miss Potter. I've been with my company for six years now. We are very informal with each other and have a fairly laid-back culture. The company president is Dave. My boss is Lou. I tell employees who call me Mr. Smith, fake name, that my name is Dennis and that there's no need for formality. We recently hired a new employee. The fake name that I will give her for this post is Jenny Potter. In coming on board with us, Jenny signed all of her emails as Miss Potter. When she answers the phone, it's, Good afternoon, this is Miss Potter speaking. When she calls me, it's, Good morning, Dennis, this is Miss Potter. And my response is always, Good morning, Jenny, how can I help you? If I send an email to Jenny, the response is signed by Miss Potter. Emphasis hers. She is three levels below me in a different line of report in terms of company hierarchy. So her supervisor's boss reports to someone on the same level as me, if that makes sense. It got back to me that she thinks I'm disrespectful for not calling her Miss Potter when I speak to her. When I speak to others about it, most state that they just ignore it. Don't use a name to address her or respond to her queries and let her call herself whatever she wants to. My boss thinks it's idiotic and that she's not at any level within the company to demand that. When I told my wife, she replied that it's obviously a button for this woman and I'm being a jerk by antagonizing her. My counterpoint to this is that nobody in the company gets addressed formally and if I don't call my boss or his boss by anything but their first names, I'm not going to formally address another employee several layers down the hierarchy. You're the jerk. She's being very polite about how she wants to be addressed and you're being a jerk about it. She wants to be called Miss, call her Miss. Your position doesn't excuse this behavior, in fact, it makes it worse. She's not being that polite by demanding she be addressed with an honorific when no one else is. She's demanding she be addressed with more respect than anyone else at the company. Asking someone to refer to you as Mr. or Mrs. when everyone is on a first name basis is the same as asking someone to call you Sir or Ma'am. He's allowed to be uncomfortable with that and it makes sense that him being her superior makes it even weirder. It would be like having to call someone who works for you ma'am, or like students referring to a teacher by their first name and the professor responding with, good to see you as well, Mr. Smith. You know who historically gets referred to by their first name and asked to respond formally? Servants, typically. So yeah, the reason his position is relevant is because she's asking him to verbally refer to her as his superior when he speaks to her, even though she's dramatically inferior to him at the company. Edit. Her reasonable recourse is to ask to be called by her last name. Hey there, Potter. How's it going today? Very common practice. Very normal. No honorific or implied relationship. Very simple. And she's clearly already comfortable using the last name, so it would be unreasonable to say that Miss Potter is significantly different enough from just Potter to upset her. He gets to decide to be called by his first name or not. She gets to decide to be called by her first name or not. Just because he breaks the conventions of basic business etiquette does not mean that she has to, no matter their relative positions. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. It's about boundaries, not hierarchy. Maybe she likes to keep it formal so she can draw a line between private affairs and work-related stuff, or she simply isn't comfortable being called by her first name. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Don't you have more important things to tend to other than gossiping about coworkers and being a blabbermouth? Honestly, you sound exhausting to be around. No jerks here. She's allowed to have her preference, and I suppose you should respect that. But at the same time, I find it a bit disrespectful on her part to insist on a more formal address for herself in a work environment where that is extremely far from the norm. It would be one thing if everyone used titles at your workplace and she wished to be called properly, referred to as doctor because she has a PhD, but you insisted on saying miss or missus, but no one in your workplace uses these terms, so it's just weird. Not the jerk. This is why you always have to weed these people out during the hiring process. My husband is a hiring manager for a large company, so I get to see the ins and outs. 
He'll spend days going through years of a person's social media accounts. If he sees anything at all to give off the impression that they'll be problematic, he shreds their resume and puts them on a do not hire list. I can tell you firsthand that he'd shred about 99% of the resumes from people here on Reddit. You are all just about as loony as it gets. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the new employee? Please let us know. I'd start calling her Harry. Wee, 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 wee. Am I the jerk for not wanting to continue my daughter's gymnastics training? When my daughter was young, we introduced her to gymnastics. She was totally hooked and kept asking for more and more lessons. We encouraged her, thinking she would eventually lose interest. Now she's 12, training 20 hours a week, spending weekend after weekend competing at high-level competitions. Problem is, she's 5'7 already and still growing. She's starting to have ambition for D1 scholarships or even the Olympics. That makes me very worried. Being 5'7 basically destroys her chance of going to the Olympics. D1 gymnastics scholarships are already rare. The odds of her getting one with her height are even more rare. It makes me feel bad that our daughter is very, very dedicated. She's almost always the first one at the gym and the last one to leave. She watches replays of her routine on our drive to training, turns down social events because she needs to train, does extra conditioning at home. Yet, I cannot justify blowing thousands of dollars a year and hundreds of hours in time every year to gamble on something with so little chance of success. All the hours spent at her training, driving her to competition, is already causing our family life to suffer. She under-rotates her skills because of her height and gets injured more frequently than others. Her academics are suffering because of her gymnastics commitment. Her life is going in the wrong direction because of gymnastics. The band-aid is better ripped off earlier than later. My husband agrees. I broke the news to my daughter. Frankly, it broke my heart to tell her to give up on something that she's worked so hard for. I told her I know she's a hard worker. She would get much better rewards if she channels her hard work somewhere else like in school or in other sport. She plays tennis with her family only casually, yet she was able to win a few U12 tournaments locally. If that's not talent, I don't know what is. Needless to say, she did not take that well. She cried and cried and cried, locking herself in a her room, refusing to eat, saying maybe if she doesn't eat, she will become shorter. I told her over and over that I love her and I just want what's best for her, but she wouldn't have any of it. I tried to reason with her, telling her chasing a dream is a privilege, not a right. No use. My husband has now softened even though we used to have an agreement. Our family is now phoning us to try and persuade us to let her continue training, even offering support for training costs and pickup and drop-offs. If she has the right body to be an elite gymnast, or if she is tall like she is but is not struggling because of her height, I would support her unconditionally. However, that's not the case. Sometimes I feel like giving in, but to think it through, I was the person who drove her to training and competition. I'm the breadwinner who paid for her training. It should be my right to call it off, especially as a parent. Help me out, Reddit. Am I in the wrong? You're the jerk. You're taking away her passion instead of trying to come up with a compromise that still allows her to train and participate in what she loves. I was a dancer and too tall for anything. You know what? I continued to dance into my late teen years. I was aware of my limitations, but dance was never taken from me. You're taking something away from your daughter without even discussing it with her or trying to work something out. I'm going to say no jerks here. Ex-athlete here that peaked at a whopping 5'2 in a tall people sport. I completely see both sides. Constant overtraining is just going to lead to a lifetime of injuries. I'm 46 and need surgery on three joints. But I loved playing and no one could tell me to stop. So here I am, broken by age 40, in for a lifetime of pain. Maybe try diving. Same skills, not the same height limitations. Can you taper off? 20 hours a week, frequent injuries, no social life, and grades not as good as they could be are super valid reasons to want her to focus her energy in other places too. This right here. The people commenting, you're the jerk, clearly have no idea how much time, effort, and sacrifice it takes to be a serious athlete. My younger sister was in the same boat, swam six hours a day, and wanted to make it a career. However, she's five foot six, and even she understood that it wasn't going to happen once she stopped growing. Reality sucks, but it's just that, reality. You don't get to change it because you want something really badly. Not the jerk. All the you're the jerk people are totally unrealistic. You're spending thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours, and commenters are like, but she loves it. 
her grades and social life are suffering, and she's getting injured, and commenters are like, but she loves gymnastics. That's irrelevant. Parents are supposed to step in when necessary. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Parents need to be realistic with their kids. Reddit boy used to want to be a rapper. Imagine if his parents had just encouraged his delusions. Come on, Karen, can't you keep anything a secret? Take me to my job. I don't care if the car has no gas. This happened a few weeks ago. I've been with my boyfriend for almost a year. He's a sweet guy with a big heart who loves me a lot. The thing is, he has a narcissistic mom who thinks she can do no wrong and everything bad in her life is somehow my boyfriend's fault. The thing is that she is also very stupid and constantly forces my boyfriend to do things that go against a regular person's common sense that instantly backfires. My boyfriend, if he wanted to, could write a post in this sub every week, but he doesn't know how to write in English, so here I am. I was spending the weekend at his house like I usually do. His mom's health these last few months has been terrible because of a bug bite on her leg. She hasn't received instant medical care because she was more focused on her work than her well-being, and the bite ended up rotting a hole into the flesh. So she now has to be forced to take proper medical care. This woman is so incompetent that she's a danger to herself. Anyway, their car has been broken for many months, but my boyfriend finally managed to make it work again. I know nothing about cars, but it's a Ford Fiesta from, I think, 2010 or older. His mom can't drive, so as soon as the car was working again, started to use my boyfriend as her personal taxi, just as we expected. She wants him to drive her to work at 5 a.m. and sometimes also wants him to drive her back home, which is a pain because our workplace is far away in the middle of our city. But if he refuses, she throws a childish tantrum until he says okay. She literally could get away with anything by throwing tantrums, even for stupid things. Once she was angered because boyfriend forgot to clean a small corner, after he left the entire house perfectly clean. Back to the story. Friday in the afternoon, he picked me up at my workplace and we got to his house. We took a highway when the car started to lose some power until it shut itself down. We ran out of gas. He was angry because of all the times that his mom had made him waste so much gas that week. Tried to turn it on and after some trying, he did it. Every few hundred meters, the car would shut down again and we had to turn it back on. We barely managed to get to the house and we had to call someone to give us two liters of gasoline that I paid for in cash so we could arrive. His mom came back at 8 p.m. and we told her how we ran out of gas. The next morning, we were asleep when she aggressively knocks on the door at 5 a.m. to wake my boyfriend up. This is usual. After he got out of the room, she told him to drive her to work. I was buried in the bed and then heard the loud tantrum outside that my boyfriend told her that the car had no gas. She was screaming for about 10 to 15 minutes. Yes, the car will make it. Son, I can't ask you for a favor without you being ungrateful. Why can't you take me to work? What an inconsiderate son I have. You want to make me walk with this leg? You will see that the car still has enough gas to get there. My boyfriend got into the room, took the keys, shoes, jacket, and stormed out. I didn't get out of bed. He was back in like half an hour. He told me that after the car shut down the first time while going uphill, she went quiet. The car did shut down three more times and she said nothing, maybe realizing that no, the car won't make it. They only managed to get to a bus stop where she could take a bus directly to her work, left her there and came back. The thing is that this woman never learns from her mistakes because it's somehow always someone else's fault. But at least she might feel quietly ashamed this time. And don't worry, my boyfriend and I have an exit plan so he can cut contact with her. We both have had enough. Am I the jerk for not wanting my ex's son at my Christmas? Trying to be concise. I was with my ex for about seven years, never married. Lived together the last four. Broke up three years ago. She has a 21-year-old son, Shane, who is now going to college in a town that I have since moved to that his parents do not live in, about a six-hour drive. We've moderately kept in touch since the breakup, mostly just when he reaches out to me. I would have preferred a clean break from both him and his mom but I've had a hard time totally shutting people out. I've not seen Shane in person since he was 18. Anyway, I got married last year and welcomed my first child six months ago. This will be my first Christmas with my wife and our child. Shane was going to go visit where his mom lives now for Christmas, but due to a pending storm, it's uncertain if he will be able to travel there. He called me last night and asked if he could spend Christmas with me. 
I was definitely caught off guard and told him while it's good to hear from him, it will be my first Christmas as a whole family and I'd prefer to keep it to just us and maybe her parents who will stop by later. Shane was very upset, told me I was replacing him. I tried to reason with him that this is just what happens when adults move on in life. I said we could still keep in touch, but I wanted Christmas to be just with my family since it's our first one. He hung up and then later sent me a long text saying some super not nice things. My wife is glad I said no, but at the same time says she empathizes with how he feels and I should apologize but not necessarily have him over, but would support me if that's what I want. Am I the jerk for not wanting him to come over for Christmas? Edit. Shane's mother and I were never married. Shane's father is active in his life. He is just off and out of town. I only had met Shane a few times until he moved in during his high school years. He was very active in sports and extracurriculars, so he wasn't actually home that much for us to spend time together. Them moving in was supposed to be temporary after his mom got laid off and it just kind of dragged into them staying. His mother was very adamant that Shane had a father and she didn't want me to attempt to parent her kid. While he lived at my house, I was basically an adult roommate. We got along well, but it was never a father-son type relationship. Can't believe the people that are voting you're the jerk. OP, you are not the jerk. You and your ex broke up years ago. You have your little family now. Yeah, the baby might not remember their first Christmas, but you and your wife will. Happy holidays. Not the jerk. An unbelievable number of people commenting you're the jerk don't seem to have actually read the post. One, OP did not take on a fatherly role. He was explicitly told by Shane's mom she didn't want that. Two, Shane's father was and still is in his life and regarded by him as his father. Three, they weren't married. Not that important, but people can't read. Four, everyone crying that Shane has nowhere to go, will be left alone on Christmas, etc. OP states he could travel to spend Christmas with friends or family. Five, lots are criticizing OP for letting the situation go on as long as it has, but then want him to double down and have him over for an awkward Christmas with a family he's no longer part of and make it even more difficult to separate properly? Shaking my head. Yikes, dude. He was your stepkid basically for seven years. He stranded for Christmas. Would it seriously hurt you if he came over for Christmas? I'm grossed out by this, not gonna lie. If virtually anyone I have a stable relationship of any kind with asked if they could come to my house for Christmas, I would say yes, because it's Christmas. You're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. It's an awkward, awkward Christmas. My ex's son that I haven't seen in years came over. I took a coworker's spot after they complained that I was arriving late. My commute to work got progressively longer and unpredictable over the past year due to four bridge closures occurring within months or weeks of each other. No date had been given for their reopening, so for the time being, short of heading off for work an hour or two ahead of time, you risk arriving a minute to five minutes late once or twice a week. Everyone had been impacted by the traffic in one way or another, which I mention because there was no way someone could feign ignorance. One coworker though didn't care about legitimate reasons for my being slightly late for work every now and then and complained so adamantly behind my back about it that my immediate supervisor reluctantly wrote me up. I knew it had to be that one coworker because they would get noticeably irritated whenever traffic conditions were brought up. They would leave the room, loudly interrupt with unimportant questions or comments or just roll their eyes. They're also known for complaining about every little thing at one point, having played a big role and not having a seasonal employee rehired the following year. Despite that coworker, I love my job, so I started leaving for work an hour and a half earlier than before. My arrival time is now anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes before my shift starts, and that's when I notice the annoying coworker always arrives about 10 minutes early and always has a very convenient street parking space available. I used to park on a different side of our building before traffic got bad and had never noticed that they had unofficially claimed that public parking spot as theirs. Most of the time, I'm at work early enough to get my pick of any spot in our always crowded employee parking lot, but no parking spot other than theirs makes up for my having to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. That coworker can't complain about my being late now. They know better than anyone that I'm at work way before I have to be. I've mentioned my arrival time to other coworkers with them in earshot, so they know I'm parking there out of spite. I've also gone as far as parking right in the middle of a space large enough to accommodate their car and mine. 
I have no idea if they've complained to our supervisor about it or not, but I really want them to have been stupid enough to complain about my taking their public parking spot away. Am I the jerk for refusing to buy my husband an expensive car even though I have the money? My husband, male 35, and I, female 30, have been married for the past 10 years and we have five amazing daughters together. Because of that, I dropped out of college and have been a stay-at-home mom for the past 10 years when we had our oldest daughter. My husband is the breadwinner and I take care of all of the chores and childcare. While my husband earns quite a bit of money, which allows us to live comfortably, he's also obsessed with budgeting, thus I typically only have enough for household expenses. For the past five years, I've been working on a series of books. I've been writing everywhere I could, five minutes here, five minutes there, and while I sacrificed a lot of sleep, I have managed to finish my series, unbeknownst to my husband. I kept it a secret because he always considered it a waste of time. It was tough, but I managed to get an agent and was incredibly lucky to get a deal to have my series published. I was ecstatic, and when they told me how big my advance would be, I almost fainted. It's much more than I expected for a first-time deal. It's in the higher five digits. I haven't told my husband yet, and I had to borrow money from my sister to get an accountant. Ideally, I want that money saved up should something happen because I honestly don't know the details of our home finances or for our kids' future. Whatever will be needed. Plus, I would love to have some spending money without having to ask my husband, Greg. However, Greg found my contract and he is now demanding I get him a new car for Christmas. A very expensive new car, which would cost the majority of my advance. I politely refused, saying that he didn't need a car that expensive and that money was supposed to be saved up. I tried to explain my position, but he wouldn't have it. He basically called me a jerk without actually using the word. He basically called me a jerk. He said that because he supported me all these years, I owe him and that without him and his money, I wouldn't be where I am now. He's told me that I either buy him the car or I have to start paying for household expenses half and half. The thing is, I would still be a stay-at-home mom. I don't know if my book will be a success. For all I know, this will be the only money I will ever get from my book deal because it'll flop. Am I the jerk for not wanting to buy my husband a car even though I have the money? Not the jerk. You've been working at home for 10 years, cooking, cleaning, looking after five kids. Let's do the math. Median US wage is about $70,000 per year. I actually looked it up. That would be about $700,000 over 10 years. Wages your husband hasn't paid you. Even if he's paid for costs like your clothes, etc., there's still quite a chunk missing in wages. Your husband doesn't let you in on his finances, so you have to live in uncertainty about you and your kid's future. And I don't think that's right. He should be open about things like that. Have you ever seen a bank statement? Do you know his internet banking password? You really ought to know. He's really secretive about it and he shouldn't be. You really, really need to discuss these things with him before anything else. If I were you, I would open a bank account in my own name, put the money you earn from writing books in there, and not tell him your password or anything about it. I've seen a lot of these if we pay to stay at home mom, what one would have to pay an actual employee. The numbers get big fast when you consider the job covers childcare, drivers, housekeeper, and a few other titles I can think of now. Plus, often it's a 24-7 job, so not 9 to 5. The fact that you people are now claiming that the husband who works all day should be paying his wife to have the privilege of being a stay-at-home mom shows just how far our world has fallen. I'm a stay-at-home mom myself, and I thank God every day that I get to stay home with my kids while my husband chooses to go out and provide for us. We choose to have babies, and as mothers, we instinctually should desire to love and care for them. Expecting money in return for taking care of your babies, that's just sick. And if you truly feel that way, I hope you never bring kids into the world. And you wonder why men's mental health is suffering so much. Imagine having to go to work all day so your wife can stay home with the kids, then having her expect a salary for doing so. You people need serious help. Not the jerk. And a higher five digits advance, you are aware that big chunks of that are going to be going to your agent and to taxes, right? I mean, if you actually get 50% of your advance in your pocket, you're going to be doing well here. And let's say that 50K is not entirely a lot for years of work. You likely could have made that much working part-time retail over 10 years. Save it. Fire me from my job with no notice? I'll ruin your entire company. So start of December, I was let go at my job because they didn't have the time to train me for the job role. 
I needed to take out a loan to survive as it took me three weeks to find something new. I was hired for customer service administrator role and as I had never done that type of work, I was told I'd be given full training on the job. The girls in the office never bothered and I simply learned the job myself. I was told my performance was more than they expected but suddenly I was called into the office at 8.30 a.m. when I arrived and told they were really sorry but they didn't have the time to train me so I would be let go immediately with no warning or notice. I was completely shocked by this. To add, my contract stated that I was to be given 28 days notice of termination. The company I worked for uses government grants as a form of payment so they would regularly claim they have done certain things they haven't to make more profits from the government such as forging signatures and lying about what work they have done to gain more funding. Basically, we get funding on government for providing services to lower income customers, that's all I can say. I was involved in a different department, but shared an office with a department responsible for lying about profits. It's a small company and the director would constantly hassle them to forge signatures as we can get the jobs through quicker and if we had an audit, he would go to prison for what was being done. So when I got laid off, not by a manager, but someone who worked the same level in my department, I was absolutely livid that they dragged me in a 60 to 80 minute drive for me to leave two minutes later. I got home and immediately called the fraud whistleblower helpline. Nothing came of this until a week later when they wanted more details. Thing is, I'm very good at being silent and taking in my surroundings. I was able to tell them which accounts had been forged and lied about. I also had considerable email evidence of what had been going on. So long story short, the majority have lost their jobs, including the people who couldn't be bothered to train me and went running to the director to fire me, including the director who is now being investigated for fraud and facing time in prison and a massive fine. Always live by the mantra, mess around and find out. Edit. By company, it was a tiny one that only employed around 12 people, so a lot of sketchy stuff happened as they weren't regulated. Going through a messy divorce and my mother still expects me to prepare for Christmas as usual. Context. I'm 26 and going through a very messy divorce. Been going on for nearly six weeks now. Only found out I was keeping my house two weeks ago and managed to get my cats out of foster care and bring them home. Everything I have is going into keeping this house running as smoothly as possible as I'm mentally disabled so I have to rely on the benefit system. Whenever I can't buy physical gifts, I've always done baking hampers for my friends and family. Usually start at the beginning of December and get huge amounts of hampers made. My friends and family know what is happening and the majority of them have said they'll wait until January to get their hampers this year as I've been scrubbing and sorting everything out as my ex-wife left me to do everything. Paperwork, finances, house, and our cats. Haven't stopped for two weeks until I finally collapsed out of exhaustion and got the flu this past four to five days. I've informed everyone I can what's happening and everyone just wants me to get back on my feet and get better. Everyone but my mother. Like I said, it usually takes me a month to prepare the hampers. That includes homemade everything, Christmas cake, gingerbread, cheesecakes, brownies, and tarts as a minimum for every hamper. I usually make around 10 to 15 hampers so you can imagine how much work and time it takes. It's only in this last week have I sorted out the kitchen so I could start preparing and then the flu has struck me down. I've been sleeping most days because I physically cannot stop falling asleep. My mother is coming down Friday night and Saturday morning. I've had to say to her that I'm too physically ill and weak to do the usual orders in that time frame. I said that I'd do what I can, but most of it will come after Christmas now. That's not good enough for her. She said she wants the bare minimum, two full-size cheesecakes, a vanilla bean one and a caramel one with homemade caramel and she also wants two full-sized Christmas cakes. She's not a baker. She doesn't realize how much work just the Christmas cake is, never mind the cheesecakes. The only reason these are essential is because they're being gifted to family members who no one likes, but we have to impress anyway because it's on my stepdad's side. I'm just so frustrated and tired and ill, and I feel like she's being entitled. This was the reason I stopped doing a big batch of baking for her. She's always expecting a variety of time-consuming desserts ready whenever she decided she'd pop down and it was my ex who told her to stop last time. I get it's Christmas, but I'm going through a horrendous time right now and I'm just trying my best. Tell her not to come. Full stop. You aren't a free bakery. These things are gifts. Very generous gifts too. Not something she's entitled to. I hope you feel better.
Email her the recipes and let her know that you'd like her to make two extra for you as well before she arrives, and if she could make four trays of brownies, that that would be ideal. I yelled at my mom that I hate Harry Potter and to let me live my own life. As my title suggests, my mom is a huge Harry Potter nut. She and my dad actually met in a Harry Potter IRC, like Discord but for old people, in the early 2000s, got married and had kids, and from day one decided to embarrass us for life by naming us after some Harry Potter and Star Wars characters. It's honestly been horrible. I have a stupid name, and since we were little, my parents have forced stuff like Harry Potter, Star Wars, Marvel movies, etc. down our throats. Everything is about dragons and magic and blah blah blah. I'm so sick of it. Every birthday, every holiday, everything is just organized around fandom. So just like every Christmas, the days leading up to Christmas, we have to sit down every night and watch Harry Potter movies. It's so boring. I can usually get away with knitting or drawing on my iPad during this, but this year my mom was like, let's just have a technology and distraction free night every night. I arranged to go over to my friend Missy's house instead for like two nights. Missy's family is normal and likes things a normal amount. My mom got really mad and started talking about how it's a family tradition and how I'm basically rejecting her and went on her whole thing about how you wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Harry Potter. I finally had it and just yelled, nobody cares that you were a big name in the Harry Potter fan club. I don't like Harry Potter. I don't like Star Wars. I hate Marvel movies. They're all so boring. Please just let me have my own interests. I couldn't help it. I started crying because I was just so frustrated because everything always has to be Harry Potter this, and Star Wars that, and now that we're all older, they started doing Game of Thrones. Everything is centered around some kind of movie or TV show or book series. Just once, I want my family to band around something that doesn't have to do with media or these nerdy things. We live in Utah where we have like five national parks, and even though I ask every year for my birthday, I've never been to Arches. Well, my sister called me saying that my mom was angry and to just come home and to stop with the theatrics. I told her I'm sick of having all this old nerd stuff crammed down my throat and just once I want to have a normal time watching normal Christmas movies and not having to pause for lightsaber battles. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. And your post is a great warning for all those people still thinking about naming their kid Anakin or Khaleesi. You're allowed to have your own interests, and your parents aren't making life easier by forcing things they like on you. My boyfriend demands I wear an ugly sweater to Christmas dinner with his family. My boyfriend and I have been dating for a few months, and he invited me to meet his family for the first time for Christmas dinner. According to him, it's his brother's, he has three, family tradition to make new partners wear an ugly Christmas sweater of their choosing as a rite of passage, his words, for entering the family. At first, I thought the concept was cute. I had imagined things like Santa getting stuck in a chimney, lights, bells, etc. But when they mailed me the sweater, my jaw dropped. It was probably the most inappropriate Christmas sweater I've ever seen. Without getting too much into detail, let's just say that Santa was participating in an act that was not okay to be seen in public. I personally thought it was gross, and it was bad enough that if someone at work saw me wearing it, I'd definitely get in trouble. I told my boyfriend that in no way would I wear this, but he said I was being a wet blanket and unsupportive of his family tradition. I said I'd wear any other sweater and would even pay for one myself, but he just called me a spoil sport. I do love my boyfriend, so I actually considered wearing it and asking people to not take pictures as a compromise, but the day of the party, I decided not to wear it last minute. I had to drive separately from work, so my boyfriend didn't know about this prior. When his brother opened the door, he eyed me up and down, and I could tell he wasn't happy that I didn't wear the sweater. My boyfriend was really upset when he saw me, and we argued in the guest room for a bit. His brothers teased me for being so uptight, and I could tell the jokes embarrassed my boyfriend. I ended up leaving the party early without my boyfriend, and we've been fighting via text since. Now, I'm thinking that I was the jerk for taking the joke too seriously. Not the jerk. I honestly thought by the title it was one of those cheesy ugly sweaters, but it seems like it wasn't that. It also seems like they want to turn you into the butt of a joke for the evening. Also, I'm guessing none of the males wore ugly sweaters either. Not the jerk. Ugly sweaters are one thing. Crude sweaters meant as hazing are another thing. 
That your boyfriend supported the sweater should be a little concerning. Honestly, if a family has a habit of hazing new partners, the best thing you can do for yourself is to set proper expectations immediately and not play along. Starting out with them in a compliant, don't rock the boat attitude is just kicking the can down the road. If they're testing your threshold for compliance and mistreatment, then non-compliance is key. If they're just mean people who are more concerned with their own hilarity, eye roll, than they are with making a guest feel welcome, then again, you're telling them right up front to leave you out of it. Not the jerk. And depending on your boyfriend's willingness to protect you now, in the beginning, when you're still in the honeymoon phase and everyone is on their best behavior, really take a long, hard look at this family's dynamics. With the expectation that the first year or two are when everyone's putting their best foot forward, the inference is that it's all downhill from here. Are you really looking down the road and seeing a good outcome here? Update. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to message me. After reading your comments, I really thought long and hard about my boyfriend's family and whether or not I wanted to be with a partner who wouldn't respect my boundaries. We got into one final fight when he nagged me to apologize to his brothers all separately. I told him that if he wore the sweater they bought me to our friends miss party, about 15 to 20 attendees, then I'd apologize. He immediately freaked out and said no and tried to argue that they wouldn't understand because it's not their tradition. I explained that it had nothing to do with tradition, but rather with my personal comfort level and whether or not the sweater was an appropriate article of clothing. I asked him why he felt uncomfortable wearing the sweater in front of friends and he refused to answer. He froze up and that's when I realized it wasn't going to work out. He knew that it was inappropriate and he himself refused to wear it in public, yet he was too stubborn to apologize and be on my side. I told him it wasn't going to work out, so I guess I'm going into the new year single as a Pringle. A few friends found out about the breakup already and this might have made me a jerk for now, but I sent them the photo of the sweater and explained what happened. I'm also glad to know that even people in real life were grossed out. I don't know what will happen with his friendships with those people, but it's none of my business at this point. Thanks guys, and happy holidays. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend and his family? Please let us know. Good job, OP. Now that's what you call dodging a bullet. A Christmas bullet. Am I the jerk for upstaging my wife and our Christmas cookie baking tradition? I'm 25 male and my wife is 23 female and we have a tradition every Christmas where we would bake Christmas cookies and frost them with our friends. We would then give the cookies out to friends and family and helpers. Every year my wife would take on the bulk of the baking duties insisting that only she knew how to bake them right and only letting whoever is helping frost them. She always insisted on doing all the baking because frosting is the fun part and the only thing people want to do. Usually this frosting and baking marathon would last until the wee hours of the morning and start around noon. Well, this year, for reasons that aren't relevant to this post today, she won't be available on the day we normally do all of this. She was sad that we wouldn't be able to do our cooking tradition. I said that I was more than capable of baking the cookies. She seemed to think I was joking and that I could basically never do it myself. Well, I said I'd try, and she wished me a sarcastic good luck. Well, in the run-up to the days of baking and frosting, I started running drills to optimize production. I started rearranging the house in various configurations, running tests on the dough we were using to see how long it took to bake and making appropriate changes while running it by taste testers, substituting ingredients for quicker bake time while preserving taste, making the cookies as thin as possible without compromising frosting ratio, canvas space for creativity and or comprising structural integrity, etc. Come the day of baking, I have everything down to a science. And friends and family come in, I give them the rundown. After a couple hours, most kinks are worked out and cookies are flowing out at a breakneck pace. Eventually, we start running out of material, something that never happened when my wife was running it. We start making runs to the store for the necessary raw materials to fuel our mighty cookie forges. By the time we were exhausted around 2 a.m., we had produced at least five times the amount of cookies we ever had before. Well, my wife gets home a couple days later and is weirdly upset. She insists the cookies taste weird, that we spent too much money, and that I was actively trying to make her look bad by making so much more than her. In truth, I ran blind tests to see if anyone could differentiate between our old recipe and mine, and no one could. I also only spent 40% more than previous years as I slotted in some cheaper ingredients and bought some stuff in bulk, and I had absolutely zero intention of upstaging her. I simply had the goal of maximizing cookie production. 
She says that even if I didn't do it on purpose, that I should have thought about how it made her look to our circles and that I have embarrassed her, and she actually called me a jerk. She's never called me a jerk in all three years of our marriage, so I can't help but think I am. Am I the jerk? I don't know if you're the jerk, but it sounds like you took something she enjoys and was sad about missing and did it without her. I would be sad if someone did that to me personally. Edited to add my vote, not the jerk. To me, it sounds like she didn't think he could do it, or even better than her. Also, it's a tradition. Why do they have to stop because one person is missing for that year? She liked baking and basically gatekeeping it from others. He didn't do anything wrong with taking it over and trying at it for one time that his wife couldn't do it. Not the jerk. If it's a tradition you do together, then yeah, you don't do it on your own. My husband and I apple pick and strawberry pick together every year. I couldn't see myself going alone. It's a tradition that we do it together. I'd be hurt if he went without me. Not the jerk. You didn't do anything wrong per se, and your methods sound fun and add a competitive edge which enhances the excitement for some people. But no one likes to discover that a tradition on which they've spent time and effort and enjoy doing doesn't need them at all to function and may even be better without their hard work. Maybe consider telling your wife how much you and your friends missed her at this year's event and that you'd rather have her and less cookies than so many more cookies without her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. So sensitive, so sensitive. I can't believe she's making a big deal of this. Blind me in traffic with your high beams? Okay, two can play this game. I was driving home from work and traffic was backed up pretty badly for a few miles. It was stop and go. When I get stuck in that, I'll usually back about 75 feet off the car in front of me so that I can hold a pace and move at a slow but constant roll, like the semi-trucks do. This way, I'm not participating in the bumper-to-bumper -bumper move and break like the rest of the smooth brain drivers. Some dude in an Acura crossover was behind me, and I guess he was getting upset because I wasn't two feet from the car in front of me, driving like a smooth brain. So he gets up on me and starts beeping his horn at me. I think to myself that it's funny as I turn up my radio. But then he starts flashing his brights at me, which is where I get annoyed. He's in one of those Acuras that has a super bright LED headlight. My car is much lower than his, so his low beams are already pretty bright in my mirrors. Bright enough that I don't want to look in them. The first time he flashed his high beams, it put spots in my vision for a moment. It genuinely hurt my eyes. After the first flash, he waited for about 10 seconds, beeps his horn, and then flashes again. Now I'm getting upset. I'm thinking, where do you want me to go? Do you really think being two feet from the car in front of you will make traffic move faster? Then he does it a third time, but this time he held them on for about 15 seconds. Time for the gloves to come off. During those 15 seconds, as I'm looking away from my mirrors, I see my 14,000 lumen searchlight sitting in my passenger seat, at which point I'm immediately overcome by a wave of chaotic, lawful excitement that he has just set in motion and cannot be stopped. I think to myself, oh buddy, you just opened the wrong can of worms. You're going to learn today. I grab the flashlight and set it to its absolute max, 14,000 lumen brightness setting. The flashlight has a sensor in it to automatically dim the light if facing down on a table, because otherwise the diodes would get so hot they would melt the lens. The 14,000 lumen setting is so intense, the 57 watt hour battery can only hold it for 180 seconds before the flashlight automatically notches down to a measly 9,500 lumens. During those 180 seconds, the light will burn through 15% of its battery power. For reference on just how bright this is, the literal sun emits a luminosity of 11,000 lumens per square foot on a bright and clear day. I turn it around and aim it straight at the back of my rear window. My car is pretty noisy, so before I turn it on, I rev up my engine to make sure that he's facing directly towards me when I flash the full force of an afternoon sun at him. I hit the power button and can only imagine the freight train of shock and pain that plowed over him. It was so bright, his automatic headlights shut off because the car thought it was daytime. With the lights on, I could see him clear as glass through his tinted windshield. He was covering his eyes and looking down, probably screaming. I watched him try to flip down his sun visor, but his hand couldn't find it, as I thought to myself, burn, you jerk. I imagine my facial expression was similar to that of a five or a six-year-old roasting insects with a magnifying glass on a bright summer day. After about five seconds of blinding light, I took mercy and shut it off. 
he proceeded to back way the heck off and move over to a different lane. Was this an unsafe thing for me to do? Absolutely. Was this illegal? Almost certainly. Was it warranted? Without question. Possibly the highlight of my year. Drive safe and don't be a jerk to the car in front of you because they might just have the tools to teach you a lesson. Am I the jerk for sulking during my birthday trip that my boyfriend's parents hijacked? There's a lot to unpack here, but I've done my best to keep it to the essentials. In preparation for my 20-something female birthday that recently passed, my boyfriend, who's also in his 20s, male, booked an overseas trip. It was a surprise, so I left everything to him. A month before the trip, he informed me that his parents, who are in their 50s, would be tagging along. This was unexpected to me. I was uncomfortable, but the booking had already been made. I probably asked if we were sleeping in separate rooms, and he replied no due to financial constraints. Fair. But I later forgot that I asked. He did assure me that his parents would have separate activities and we would have alone time. The trip came around. A three-day, two-night trip. Day one. While in transit, I asked why the arrangement. He disclosed to me that his mother had made a big fuss when she found out about this trip. He had been traveling with me a lot and she was upset that he hadn't been making time for his parents. On the basis that her birthday falls on the same week as mine, surprise, she insisted on joining the trip. So how could her only son say no? I did not take this new information well emotionally, especially because I don't like his mother to begin with. Also the fact that this was straight up an emotionally manipulative move. We check into accommodations and I realize we're sharing one room. We have no privacy. We have virtually no alone time together on the first day. I sleep conflicted. Day two was where it got really bad. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and with a flu. I was mentally spiraling, thinking how dare his mother impinge on a trip for me like this. I was close to crying and I couldn't even tell my boyfriend or cry. Naturally, I had zero interest in entertaining his parents. Later, I was told that I was frowning the entire day, unreceptive, disengaged, and when his mother spoke to me, I replied to her brusquely and avoided eye contact. I avoided conversations and slept whenever I could in the car. Day 3 and until now. The trip ended and I felt more liberated than anything else. A few days later, my boyfriend informs me that his mother was very offended by my actions on day 2 and she thinks I'm a brat who can't respect her elders. She doesn't want to see me for the time being. Oh no, I think. How tragic. God, how little I care. To be fair, his parents had done nothing to offend me during the trip. They did not impose on me any expectations or rules, and I would even say that his mother was accommodating and kind to me throughout. That's the one thing that makes me feel mildly bad. But in my opinion, they should never have made what was my birthday trip into a family trip. I regret acting so childishly, and perhaps I should have dealt with it better, but I am not apologetic for my feelings. Maybe she didn't deserve it, but she shouldn't have come and maybe my behavior during the trip was because I wanted to punish everyone, scorched earth style. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Dear Lord, this whole thing is the biggest red flag of all time. Run now or start mentally preparing for them to tag along on your honeymoon. Not the jerk. Seriously, your birthday trip with your boyfriend turned into a family vacation, sharing a single room with his parents and you were not feeling well and you're supposed to entertain them? Oh no. It was your trip, and you were there for you, not them. You need to ask yourself if you want this type of crap happening all the time because your boyfriend needs to grow a spine and boundaries with his mother or you need a new boyfriend because if one of the two don't happen, you're going to be putting up with this for the rest of your life. Am I the jerk for flipping out on a dog owner for ruining lunch? This happened about an hour ago at the time of typing. I have a three-month-old and wife is still on maternity leave. They came to visit me at work and brought Chick-fil-A for lunch. There's a canal area that has half a dozen decent-sized grassy areas with benches. There's a walking path along it that gets a decent amount of traffic. We find a completely empty grassy area with a bench. There's no one around and it's really nice out. My kid is sitting in the stroller just being chill. I'm talking to both my kid and wife while we're eating. My kid starts crying and I pick him up to soothe him. I see an over 50 guy walking by and he's eyeing us. Figured he was looking at my kid since he was crying. When all of a sudden, a maybe 5 pound unleashed dog comes up and starts messing with my wife's ankle. This really scared her. We're not exactly dog friendly, 
Neither of us grew up with dogs and we have zero interest in owning, let alone interacting with them. Then a second small dog walks up to us. I turn to the guy and say, get your dogs away from us. He just looks at me with his dopey look on his face, so I say it again. He half-heartedly tells the dogs to come to him. They don't listen to him. I'm like, come on, man, get your dogs away from us. We're eating lunch and don't want them around. My kid is still crying. My wife asks him to get them away too. He says to me, you don't like dogs? I'm just like, no, I don't like dogs. I also hate bad, I used a worse word, owners like you that don't leash their dogs and let them rudely walk up to people. I don't want your dogs around. He tells me I don't have to be so rude. I responded back with, you are the jerk that decided to let your dogs occupy the same 10 square feet as us despite there being other areas to go. If you wouldn't have bothered us, I wouldn't be flipping out on you. He looked shocked that someone didn't adore his dogs and walks away muttering at me under his breath. So, am I the jerk? Edit. This is not a dog park or even a regular park. Just an area with multiple grassy areas. There's a lot of signage to pick up doggy do and leash your dogs. Not the jerk. Leash laws exist for a reason. Not everyone wants dogs in their space. People have phobias and allergies are a thing. So for multiple reasons, it's irresponsible to have them off of a leash in the same area as others without knowing if they're dog friendly. The fact that you had to ask multiple times and he seemed bewildered that he was in the wrong is aggravating and you're not obligated to be nice to people who don't have any respect for others in public. Am I the jerk for blasting Disney music? I, 16 female, have an older brother who's 19. He's one of those prank YouTubers and TikTokers. He's been doing this kind of content since 2017, first on YouTube, then expanding to TikTok for short form around 2020. He's decently popular with kids and makes some pretty good money from it. It's annoying for me and I hate it. As his little sister, I'm constantly having a camera shoved in my face even when I'm busy. He's pranked me by pretending to delete my school projects off of my laptop, throwing out my homework, study material, and once fabricated a fake report card that he gave to my tech illiterate parents, which got me grounded for a month even after I prove that my grades are good because they never go back on their punishments. He has also come to my work to surprise me and prank me, which has gotten me in trouble with my manager until they moved me to working in the back and not up front with customers because he had come in so much. With my money, I recently bought a Bluetooth speaker and whenever I see him with his stupid camera, I blast whatever Disney music I can. Let it go, we don't talk about Bruno, anything I can because Disney is vicious with copyright and the footage is useless. He tried talking to me about it, usually on camera, to work out our issue, which means me stopping so that he can go back to making money off pranking me. Because I'm apparently very popular with his audience, he's been slowly losing views and followers, which he is blaming me and my speaker for. My parents are taking his side as he's providing for us and he's the golden child. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, please stop telling me to expose him or make a call out post in exposing him. I don't and will not make a permanent social media account anywhere, so that isn't possible. You have a massively dysfunctional family if your 19 year old brother's TikToks are providing for your family. Your parents suck and your brother sucks. As soon as you're 18, find a way to move out and be on your own. OP. I am. I have my job so I can save money and I have some friends who also want to move out at 18 and we plan to find an apartment and move in together. My parents are trying their best. They're immigrants and me and my brother are first generation. Before his channel, our family struggled a lot, so they see his pranks as something to endure so that we don't return to how we lived before. My brother sucks. My parents are doing their best, even if it's misguided. Based on your other comments, it sounds to me like the pranks are something for you to endure and not them. If your parents are off limits and yet they continue to reap the benefits of your brother's success, then you have every right to be off limits as well. This isn't something that is applying equally to your parents and it's unreasonable for it to be something that you solely bear the burden of. Keep blasting that music and protect that speaker. Lady can't tell the difference between food and the pattern of the table. So during last Saturday's evening shift, I had these two stray drinkers, a man and a woman, probably in their early 40s, wander from the bar area into the restaurant part and seat themselves on a table in my section. When this happens, we usually just politely explain to people, sorry guys, this part is for dining. If you're just here for drinks, the bar area is over there. 
and most of the time people are understanding. But also sometimes, if the bar is really busy and the tables aren't actually needed at that time, we just let it slide. So I tell our hostess that some drinkers set themselves on my table and ask if I should kick them out. She says, nah, it's alright, they can be there for a bit, the bar is packed. So I just ignore them and continue to serve my actual guests. Just as I'm approaching the table opposite theirs to take an order, the woman loudly says, Excuse me, the table is dirty, and points to a few crumbs in front of her. Can you wipe it? The way she said it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because it was as though she was accusing me of not keeping on top of the cleaning. But actually, if you just randomly walk in and seat yourself on a table that isn't ready yet, or for you in the first place, then you only have yourself to blame if it's dirty, right? But regardless, I just said, sure, just give me a minute. I turned back to take the order from the other table, then went and got a spray and some roll to wipe it down for them. So I go over and wipe it down, but before I can leave, the woman goes, Um, there's still some food here, and points to, I kid you not, literal air, like there's nothing there. But I wipe it down a second time anyway, just to appease her. Side note that it's literally Saturday night, and all of my other tables have guests on them, and these people aren't even supposed to be here, let alone be getting service from me. As I'm about to leave again, she shrieks, It's still dirty! And again points to the flawlessly clean table. I'm dumbfounded, but I figure maybe she's confused by the pattern of the table. They're metal and kind of have that effect where it looks like it has water stains all over it. So I kindly explain, Oh, I think it's just the sort of modeled pattern of the table, but then her husband, who had been inert up until this point, snatches the spray out of my hand and furiously sprays it all over this one spot she had been pointing at. He then thrusts his palm out at me to ask for some of the roll. I just kind of silently obliged and handed him the bunch I was holding and he goes in on this table as if he's literally trying to erode it into a pile of dust. Then he shoves the spray and roll back into my hands as if to say, that's how you clean a table. Obviously, the table looks completely the same. And I, still dumbfounded, just stare at him and then walk off. It honestly takes me a minute to stop being confused and to realize that I'm upset. I don't really feel like tolerating their existence in my vicinity now, so I relay what happened to the hostess who says I'll sort it out and heads over to the table. Hostess, hey guys, really sorry but we need this table for a booking now. We don't. Woman, do you need it literally right now? Yes. Like this exact second? Yes. Well, the bar is full. What do you expect us to do? Stand? Yes. So they angrily leave and then stand in the bar for a good half an hour with their drinks, watching over their X table, probably waiting to see if we actually do use it. We don't use it at all, and I'm fully expecting them to seek a manager to complain about us, but perhaps they had the humility to realize that they were just jerks and got evicted for it. My ex-mother-in-law demands to have a key to my house. So me and my ex have been separated for two years. We separated on good terms and we get on well despite our differences. We do have a three-year-old daughter and he works a lot so doesn't get to have our daughter often. For this reason, I gave him a spare key to my house so that he could pop in and see us whenever he wanted. I completely trusted him with this key. For context, I've never had a good relationship with my ex's mother. She's always hated me and accused me of ruining her son's life by getting pregnant so young. I was 18. She hates me so much that when I was pregnant with our daughter, she threatened to take me to court to gain full custody of my daughter. When I found this out, I was of course furious and did confront her. They were empty threats, as I honestly think she knew she'd be fighting a lost battle. She despises me, and honestly, I'm not her biggest fan either. I haven't much interacted with her since I left my ex, except from the fortnightly visits where I take my daughter to her house. Well, my ex has been coming over to the house as usual, but has not been using his key. At first, I thought nothing of this, but it became more frequent, and so I said, if you're not going to use your key, I'll have it back. He then informed me that his mom had asked for the key, so that she had access to the house and to see her granddaughter whenever she wanted. He told me he agreed. I lost my temper completely. After everything I'd gone through in the past, I had absolutely no idea why he thought it would be a good idea to give his deranged mother my key. I told him I wanted it back immediately and that I no longer wanted him to have a key. He's furious at me, saying his mother is in pieces as all she wants is to know that she can see her granddaughter whenever she so pleases. I told him that was in no way realistic 
and if she wished to spend time with my daughter, she could message or call me, and I'd bring her over with me there also. This wasn't good enough, and now him and his family are not speaking to me. So, am I the jerk? Edit. My ex only had a key, as he would often come around dinner time, and having to leave the stove or stop doing chores, etc., every day became very tedious, and it was simply convenient for him to carry a key. It was a very minor inconvenience, but it made my day slightly easier. My kid was never left home alone. Update. Locksmith has been called. Glad I'm not going insane. Thank you all. Not the jerk. Start documenting these things. Exact dates. Exactly what they do and say. This sounds like a course leading to a restraining order on the mother-in-law. Be prepared for that date. Stand your ground firmly on this issue. If he wants to invite her over while caring for his daughter, that's his choice. Giving her access to your home is a gross violation of trust and you are right to revoke that access. Personally, don't ask for the key back. Just change the locks. It will give you peace of mind that you are safe again. OP. I had started documenting back when she threatened custody, but stopped when we separated. I definitely think I should go back to it and continue it. Thank you. Well, what do you think? Should ex-mother-in-law get to keep her key to the house or not? Please let us know. I think a restraining order might be a better option. I'm worried my best friend will try to hook up with my husband. I, 36 female, live with my husband and our kid. My best friend, Stacy, who's 37, has been staying with us the last few weeks while her home undergoes renovation. I met my best friend in college and we are pretty opposite when it comes to a lot of things. She's far more carefree, particularly with men. She loves dating committed men. Wives, fiancés, or girlfriend, she doesn't care and will pursue for the thrill. There have been a couple of occasions where she's been confronted publicly by spouses and she just laughs it off after the fact. Although she can be a bit flirtatious, she's never actually done anything totally out of line with my husband, but she has with the boyfriend of a mutual friend. Now the issue. I'm going to Las Vegas in a couple days and I'll be gone for five days. I told her that I would prefer if she stayed somewhere else while I'm gone. She asked why and I told her it's because of her history of going after men in relationships and I wasn't comfortable with her there while I'm gone for so long. She got really defensive, hurt, and started to cry. She insisted that she values our friendship and would never violate that, but I held firm and said that this is just one of those things where I'd rather be safe than sorry. She'll be staying at another friend's house. I feel bad, but I also don't think I'm going to change my mind. My husband doesn't care either way and said she should understand why I feel that way, but my sister and a couple of our mutual friends said that I should trust her and even if I don't, I should trust my husband. Am I the jerk? Update. I spoke with Stacy after work tonight and it was tough. She saw this thread and was upset that I brought it to Reddit and allowed strangers to judge her. She also acknowledged that what she does is wrong and said she's working on it, hasn't been with anyone in a while, and she has issues no one understands. You got that right. She said that more than anything, she's hurt because I really thought she'd hook up with my husband despite not trying to do so in over 15 years that we've all known each other. I brought up things she's done in the past that has added to my discomfort and she insisted that it was innocent and she never meant anything by it. She said she's going to leave permanently because she doesn't feel welcome knowing she isn't trusted and she doesn't want to stay where she's not wanted. She went silent for what seemed like forever, then said, I think you did the right thing. If the situation was reversed, I would ask you to leave too. Then says again that she has issues and she's not sure why she does it. She started to cry and I told her that whatever she's going through can be worked on and she can talk to someone who can help her sort out her feelings and give her some insight and she said she would work on herself. We hugged and I told her I'll be here for her while she works through it all. Not the jerk. For people saying, don't you trust your husband? One, you know she enjoys ruining committed relationships. Two, he knows she's your friend. Why would you intentionally put him in a position where he has to ask her to leave while you are gone and tell you why he asked her? What if she made false accusations against him, either in response to him putting her out or another way to mess up your relationship? If she has changed, maybe this will be enough motivation for her to figure out why commitment to other people is such a turn on for her. If she hasn't, not the jerk for proactively protecting your family. But I too wonder why you let her stay with you in the first place, given her total lack of shame previously. Good on you for putting your husband, your family, and the future of your friendship ahead of her short-term preferences. My friend's mom refuses to pay me, so I'm suing her. My friend's mom asked me to be her social media manager. 
She could not afford my regular rate, but we agreed on an amount that's about a quarter of what I typically charge. I got all the credentials and I went right to it. I increased her following, online visibility, and her overall social media presence. The first month I had a reminder to pay my invoice, and she eventually did. The second month she cited issues with her online banking and asked my friend to pay. That never happened. We eventually agreed that I'll be paid the end of the third month. The agreed time rolled around and I got nothing but excuses. I was promised cash, but I never got it. These are usually very nice people, so I didn't think much about it. I got caught up in work and school and moving apartments. The next thing I knew, it had been over six months and I hadn't been paid for any of the services I'd been rendering. I reached out to her and she promised to pay up and said that she was having some financial difficulties. The agreed date rolled around yet again and she didn't pay me nor did she even reach out. I called her and I got no answer. I sent a message. She replied two weeks later saying that something had come up. She promised to pay again and the date came and no word. She doesn't answer my calls and she leaves me on red. We had paused working on her stuff back in June of this year but I'm still supposed to get paid. I've asked my friend twice to ask her to pay me. Now my question is, would I be the jerk for suing my friend's mom? Edit to answer some questions. 1. Sadly, there is no contract. I was naive and trusting. She's usually very nice and seemingly honest and I thought she had integrity. 2. I'm owed for 7 months work. I accept my part in this, but I was busy and in the back of my mind I'll have a lump sum to pay towards an upcoming expense that I had. Everything was good until I tried to settle the invoices. 3. We did agree on a payment plan. I haven't even been trying to collect the full amount. All this back and forth has been for two out of seven installments owed. 4. She's not broke. She lives in a nice suburb, drives a nice car. Her bills are paid. She spoils her kids and her grandkids. Also, any advice on how to be less naive so I don't get taken advantage of anymore? I have a hard time saying no. Edit 2. By Sue, I meant small claims court. It's not enough to warrant hiring a lawyer, but it's my money and I want it. It could pay for a vacation weekend, a semester in school, rent and utilities for a month, plus a trip to Costco. Not the jerk, but be prepared to lose the friend. Not the jerk. Best option is to explain to the friend what has happened and specifically show them the amount of hours that you worked on it. Explain that you need paying for these hours, as like all of us, you have bills to pay, and that if you don't, then you may need to take drastic action. That way, the friend may be able to do something and at least will understand. Not the jerk, but seek legal advice before suing. A strongly worded legal letter may be enough to show her that you're serious. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you sue your friend's mom or not? Please let us know. If I complete our agreed upon work and you refuse to pay me, darn right you're getting sued. My manager told me to take a break, so I did. I currently work at a Mexican chain here in Australia. A few months back, we had this really bad manager who was doing a placement at our store while her store was undergoing repairs from flooding. She's the type of person who looks down on you because you're a worker and she's a manager. When I first started, I did an opening shift with her. I hadn't done one before and I kept asking questions, which she kept getting annoyed at and kept acting like I should know what I was doing and kept leaving her alone. She belittled me for not getting the meats out on time, aka two minutes past opening. She yelled at me because I didn't put coriander in our salsa when we were out of coriander. She yelled at me for putting too many beans on one burrito, despite me following the build guide. She had been yelling at me and treating me very badly all day to the point that I had almost walked out and left her, but I kept my cool. It's well known in the store that I have hip dysplasia, which in turn really hurts my lower back, so I have to sit down for a few minutes and rest it. Afterwards, I'm usually fine. It's on my file and the store manager has always been fine with it as long as it's not during a rush. That day was an especially bad day. So after around 5 hours on my feet, my back was really starting to ache. So I asked her if I could sit down for a few minutes to rest as the busy period had passed. Manager. Why? Can't you just work? Me. I have hip dysplasia, so I need to sit for at least 5 minutes. The store manager has always been fine with it. Manager. That doesn't even make any sense. No, you can't sit down. Me. I'm in a lot of pain. All I need is five minutes. I'll come back out if it gets busy. No, I don't pay you to sit down. Go take your break instead. 30 minutes 
and don't come back until you're done complaining. So I made myself some lunch and sat down in our dining room. About five minutes later, the busiest rush of a lifetime came through the door. We were still a reasonably new store and hype was high. So I'm talking a line going out of the door and it kept growing. My manager's face turned white as she started serving people who are ordering large amounts of food per person. She gave me these looks of distress, asking for my help with her eyes. Cue my malicious compliance. I sat on my phone, looking as relaxed as humanly possible, taking very big and dramatic mouthfuls of my food while watching YouTube very loudly. I had customers ask me if I could hop behind the counter, but I simply said, I'm sorry. My manager sent me on break and said not to come back until I'm done complaining about my back problems and I'm still very sore. She stared daggers at me, but I just kept eating my lunch. Customers started getting angry at her for not moving fast enough to keep up with the demand, but she knows she can't blame me because of what she said earlier, so she just keeps apologizing. She was running around the back to get salads from the fridge, swapping meats around, getting new sauces, basically things that a second employee is meant to be there to help with, all while customers kept complaining. I just sat and watched, smirking as she clearly regretted not just letting me sit down for five minutes, otherwise I would have been there to help. When the rush finally ended about 40 minutes later, I clocked back on and said, thanks for the extended break, my back feels so much better now, which incited many glares in my direction. I didn't have to serve even one of the probably 40 to 50 customers that came through the door. She treated me better after that, and is now always her kindest self when she's around me, so I call that a win. Luckily, her store was repaired and she went back there. People said I was a jerk for this, but I don't care. Next week will be my final shift at that store, and I'm very thankful I'll never have to be under her management again. Am I the jerk for telling my parents they still don't have a biological grandkid? I have three adopted kids, and my parents have so far been good grandparents to them. They've never mentioned to me or my husband or to the kids anything about having a problem that I adopted instead of having biological kids. My brother and his wife have a three-month-old son who was conceived with a donor. I know this because my brother's wife talked to me about it, but my parents were not aware. They treated my nephew the same as they treated my kids when they were babies, so I've never been concerned that my kids would be seen as lesser because they're adopted while my nephew was supposedly their biological grandkid. This is why I was so surprised and confused that my parents have been talking about how excited they are to have their first Christmas with their biological grandkid and that they did a big expensive holiday photo shoot with my brother, his wife, and his son, something they've never done with my kids. They were the ones who suggested it to my brother. It's not like it's just because he asked and I didn't. The weirdest part was that they casually mentioned some of the things they bought for my nephew for Christmas as far as I can tell, they're spending more on him than they are for my three kids combined, and it's far more than what they spent even when my oldest was a baby. In fact, when my kids were little, they used to say there was no point in buying expensive things for babies for Christmas or birthdays because they wouldn't remember it, and they'd rather spend the money when they're a little older. So my nephew is suddenly being favored over my kids. At the same time, my parents are starting to emphasize the fact that, as far as they know, my nephew was their biological grandkid. I pointed this out to them and said it bothers me. They denied treating them differently. They said I was being weird about money. I truly don't even care about the money. I care about the difference in treatment and that my kids might notice how little they're getting from my parents compared to their cousin. And now for the part I'm starting to feel awful about. I told them the truth about my nephew. My parents are furious at my brother for not telling them and thank me for telling them the truth. They keep saying he tricked them and gave them false hope about having a biological grandkid, which I guess answers the question on whether biology actually matters to them. My husband says I did the right thing because it removed all the lies and secrets, and if they didn't care, it wouldn't matter. But if they did care, they deserve to know. My brother says it wasn't my secret to tell, and I jeopardized his son's relationship with our parents. Soft everyone sucks here. It wasn't your secret to tell. You were wrong to do it that way, but grandparents are super jerks and so is your brother. Here's what would have been better. Go to bro, tell him what you've seen and how it makes you feel. Tell him that he needs to tell his parents and if he doesn't, you will. But you didn't. So acknowledge that you handled your part badly, but that doesn't excuse everyone else's way worse behavior. OP's brother and sister-in-law don't have to say a darn thing if they don't want to. 
While I agree with the everyone sucks here judgment, OP isn't a saint either. I mean, let's be real here. She only spilled the beans out of spite. She spoke about a very sensitive topic instead of tearing her parents a new one and going low contact or no contact to show that she means business. If the situation was that bad, that would have been a reasonable option. Not the jerk. I'm prepared to be downvoted, but I'm willing to bet brother knew exactly how your parents felt about your kids and withheld the truth from them because he knew how they'd react. Sure, it was their info to tell, but they had no intention of saying anything of the like because they were enjoying the benefits that came with keeping their mouths shut. Your brother did not care that you or your kids were being treated differently or unfairly because he wasn't on the receiving end. Now that he is, he cares about privacy. Your actions might have been sus, but that doesn't make you the jerk here. Your brother, however, is. He was willing to do his own son a disservice by setting him up with a false relationship with his grandparents while teaching him that your kids were okay to be treated as less than. Nah, he got his just desserts. He just didn't count on eating them this soon. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their brother or their parents? Please let us know. If you're using a donor and you don't want people to know, don't tell anyone because you know they're not going to end up keeping it a secret for you. Karen wants pizza from a place that has everything but pizza. The other day I wanted a pizza. My favorite pizza place is in a supermarket nearby, one of those in-store shops. Now here's the way this place is arranged. There's the pizza shop on the right that sells only pizza and nothing else besides some refreshments. On the left, there's a grill type shop that sells everything from hot dogs to chicken breast to potato salad and everything in between, but it doesn't serve pizza at all. And then there's the common seating area, which consists of two tables and a long table along the wall, between the two where you can sit down and eat if you don't want the food to go. I grab my pizza and I see no free seat nearby when I spot someone leaving the first chair by the grill place on the long table, so I sit there and start digging into my pizza. I barely eat a slice when Karen comes to the grill. Cashier. How can I help you? Karen. I want a pepperoni pizza with cashier. I'm sorry, ma'am. We don't serve pizza here. If you want one, Karen interrupts. What do you mean you don't serve pizza? This person here, points at me, is eating one. He got it from the place next door. Okay, so go and make me one too. I can't. I don't work there. You'll have to go to- What do you mean you don't work there? This is a restaurant. You work here. Give me a pizza. Cashier. Ma'am, I'm trying to tell you that we are two separate establishments. We don't have pizza. They do. Then why is he eating pizza here? Again, pointing at me. Hey, why do you sit here? Me. There were no other free seats. It doesn't matter. If you ordered from the other side, you have to sit there. Me. It's a common area. You can sit wherever you want, no matter where you ordered. So Karen thought the two shops were just one restaurant, but for some reason, there were two separate seating areas. Karen logic. Upon hearing the commotion, a security guard comes over. Security. What's going on here, ma'am? Why are you yelling? This worker refuses to serve me and continues to say he doesn't work here. Security. Is this true? Cashier. Okay, ma'am. I'll serve you. What did you want again? Ugh, I already told you. I want a pepperoni pizza with extra cheese. Cashier looks at the guard and gestures towards Karen. Security. Ma'am, the pizza place is right over there. Karen. I know. He needs to go over there and serve me. To make this short, the story pretty much repeats. In the end, the Karen leaves huffing and puffing and swearing that she'll never come back. The cashier actually apologizes to me about the inconvenience and I said he didn't have to. Pizza and a show. This just made my day. Am I the jerk for telling my friend's mom she chose to have a child at 45? Background. My best friend and I have been best friends since we were 12. We're now 24. Her mom had her at 45. Now, before everyone tells me that's not possible, it is absolutely possible for some women. I'm not a scientist, but my friend is proof that it can happen, so I don't want to hear it. I also want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with having a kid while you're in your 40s. I don't give a hoot if you choose to have a kid while you're in your 40s. This post isn't about bashing anyone in their 40s. Basically, I'm married. We're financially stable and we decided to have a baby. I got pregnant and my best friend was overjoyed for us. She loves kids, but has been really clear that right now she's enjoying being young and doesn't really want to settle down. She doesn't see herself having kids until her mid-30s. Of course, this is absolutely fine. No judgment. 
During my baby shower, my best friend's mom kept pouting. She kept going on and on about how she's going to be extremely old by the time her daughter has kids and she won't be able to enjoy them. How she just wishes my friend would get pregnant and settle down now. How it's not fair to her that she won't be able to be a grandma. I mean ranting to anyone who would listen. My friend looked really sad. I could tell she was upset. Everyone just looked uncomfortable as she was going on. After the party, when everyone left, I talked to my friend about what had happened. She admitted to me that her mom has been really hard on her about settling down because of her age, but that she's just not ready to and she needs her to understand that. Flash forward to them meeting my baby recently. My best friend's mom launches in again. I just said to her, but Christina, you made the choice to have a baby at 45. You had to know that there was a chance you might be pretty old by the time you became a grandparent. It's not fair to try and put Allison into a life she isn't ready for because you want to be a grandparent. She got up and left but my friend thanked me later. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She needed to hear that. She may also be worried her daughter will make the same miscalculation she did by having a baby later in life. But again, she shouldn't be disturbing everyone and needs to take no for an answer. Not the jerk. Good for you for standing up for your friend. Christina needs to realize that Allison will plan her family arrangements around her own needs, not her mother's, and it was probably helpful for both of them to hear it from you. Well done. I had my second baby at 41. I fully understood I would always be the older mother with him, but it's also pushed me to take care of my health and be active so I'll be able to enjoy grandkids when I'm in my 70s. I know many active 80-year-olds. You are not the jerk. Am I the jerk for not going to my mom's house for Christmas and refusing to make my little sister go too? I'm 17 and my little sister is 15. Our dad passed about 10 years ago. It was very sudden. One day, he kissed and hugged me and my sister and told us that he loved us and then we never heard from him again. At the time, I couldn't fully grasp why he chose to stay away, even though mom tried to explain it to us. I missed him and I thought I did something wrong to make dad mad. I repeatedly called his phone, hoping he would answer, but it always went directly to his voicemail. At his funeral, I realized I would never see him again and I broke down. I don't remember much from that day, except Uncle David held me the entire time. He held me throughout the funeral, during the drive home, and as I fell asleep that night. Uncle Alan did the same thing with my sister. It wasn't easy growing up with just my mom and sis, but not as tough as it could have been because the two uncles were always a phone call away. Whenever we needed help with school, one of the uncles was there to tutor us. One of them was always in the front row of every school performance and game. Whenever I wake up in the middle of the night and miss dad, I'll call Uncle David and he'll always pick up. My mom eventually remarried Bob. I never liked Bob because he always had to be in control and placed us on a strict schedule. Dinner was at 7 every day no matter what. If we came home late and dinner was over, we didn't get to eat that night. Whenever our uncles gave me and sister money, we had to give it to Bob and he divided the money equally. A couple of months ago, sister and I were eating with Uncle David and his family. Our dinner conversation eventually led to where I want to go for college and how to pay for it. Uncle David told me that the uncles decided long ago that they were going to pay for me and sister's tuition and cost of living on campus. I cried when I heard that and laughed when he jokingly said, I hope you don't get into medical school because that would cost me a fortune. I went home and excitedly told mom and Bob that the uncles are going to pay for our colleges. Instead of being happy, they both looked furious and Bob started screaming about how unfair it was to our step-siblings and half-sister that we're getting a free ride through college. He wanted me to tell our uncles to divide the college funds equally among the kids, but I refused. The next day, he kept on screaming, so sister and I packed our bags to go to Uncle David's house. He kept screaming and even followed us out to my car. Sister and I have been living with Uncle David and his family ever since. This feels more like home than it ever did at our house. Mom has been asking us to come home for Christmas for a month now, and I've been refusing. Today is the 24th, and she's been calling all morning crying and saying how we need to spend Christmas with family. Am I wrong for not spending Christmas with my mom? Not the jerk. Bob's kids are not entitled to what your uncles have. They aren't blood relatives. I'm going to assume your uncles are the brothers of your father. You did the right thing. You and your sister were subjected to this jerk who didn't really care about you and is more interested in giving what you have to his kids. Your mother let it happen. Stay at your uncle's. They've been there for you all of your lives and it's clear they love you guys so much. Your mother sounds like when she married Bob, she chose her new family over the one she already had. Well, what do you think? 
Should OP spend Christmas with her mom or not? Please let us know. Someone on Reddit discovered that OP's mom wrote the story from her point of view about a month ago. Let's read that one next. Am I the jerk for telling my husband I'm not going to tell my ex-brother-in-laws to stop spoiling our daughters? My ex and I, 44 female, divorced when our daughters Stacy, 17 female, and Emily, 14, were young. About a year after the divorce, he passed away. My ex was paying child support, but that stopped the day that he passed. The girls inherited their father's estate, but since he was fresh into his career, it wasn't much. Things could have been rough as a single mother, but his brothers stepped into his shoes. They took the girls on the weekends and basically bought the girls anything they needed from clothing to school supplies and bought our groceries. They also indulged the girls every whim. Stacy loved horses when she was little, so Uncle John paid for her lessons and riding fees. Emily thought she wanted to play the piano, so Uncle Jeff paid for her lessons and bought her a piano. When the girls grew out of those phases and got interested in something else, their uncles were there ready to indulge them. I tried talking to the uncles about not spoiling them, but they said that their nieces needed to explore their own interests and those explorations will help their brain developments. I disagree, but was not in a financial situation to push too hard because they were paying so much for the girls. I was basically responsible for only the rent. I later remarried a wonderful man who brought two kids into the family. We had one more kid together and things are good for the most part. However, kids are smart. So my daughter's step and half-siblings started to notice their sisters having more experiences and things than they do. My husband didn't like the situation and we had some arguments about it over the years. Things came to a boiling point recently when we were discussing how to pay for our two oldest kids' college, Stacy and her stepbrother Rick, who's 18, male. Both are good students and while they haven't gotten their acceptance letters, I have no doubt they'll get into good schools. My husband and I make enough money to live a middle-class lifestyle with five kids but not enough to put them through college. The reality is that they'll have to take out school loans. We talked to both of them about loans, and this is when I found out Stacy had already talked to her uncles, and they're paying for her tuition and cost of living wherever she wants to go. This floored us and made my husband extremely mad. He got red in the face and started to scream how it's not fair Stacy and Emily will get to go to expensive colleges and graduate with no loans, while our other kids will have to go to state schools and take out loans. He wanted me to call John and Jeff and tell them to stop spoiling the girls. On one hand, I agree 100% with my husband that it's not fair to my other kids, but on the other hand, I can't hold my daughters back from something so wonderful. In the end, I told my husband I'm not going to tell my ex-brother-in-laws to stop spoiling our daughters. Was I wrong to tell him that? Update. Thank you all for reading my post and answering my question. Things have gone downhill and now I'm crushed. I was at work, and without my knowledge, my husband called John and yelled at him to mind his own business, told him we don't want their money and to stay out of our lives. My husband then went and yelled at the girls as they packed their bags and as they were leaving for their uncles. When I got home, my husband wanted to call the police to report them as runaways, but I talked him out of it. I went over to John's house, and his wife led me to the kitchen where we stood in silence, watching John holding them while they cried. For a minute, I pictured their father holding them. Stacy and Emily refused to talk to me when they walked past me on their way upstairs to their room. John and I had a long conversation about the whole situation. He basically told me he's doing what his brother couldn't, and both me and my husband can buzz off if we don't like it. He said the girl should stay with him and his family until things calm down, and I agreed. So this is where we are now. Also, to answer some common questions. 1. My husband makes less money than I do, so he's been unable to save up college tuition. 2. His ex is still in the picture and has visitation rights. She makes less money than him, so they have nothing saved up, much less tuition. Not the jerk. Your daughter shouldn't miss out from their paternal relatives just because your husband and the other kids might be super jealous. Those other kids have something your oldest don't, their dad. You'd be a gigantic jerk if you were anything besides grateful for the generosity of your former husband's brothers towards your oldest kids. Edit. Regarding the update, that is horrible, OP. You might want to reconsider being married to such a selfish man. He doesn't sound wonderful like your original post portrayed him prior to the update. I hope you and your oldest daughter are in a good place already or very soon. Keep on supporting their dreams. Your daughters will never ever forgive you if you sabotage their chance to graduate without debt. Nor should they. That would be an incredibly cruel and spiteful thing to do to them. And ironically, your husband's bitterness is making him short-sighted about the other kid's well-being.
Having your girl's uncles assume the financial burden for their living expenses will free you up to help with the other kids where you can. Finally, is it normal for your husband to get red-faced and scream about financial stress or the realities of a blended family? The substance of his demands that you sabotage your kids' opportunities is unacceptable itself, but the way he's expressing himself is also creating an atmosphere of fear and distrust. Personally, I wouldn't consider him a wonderful man until he agrees to therapy to figure out how to cope with his frustrations. Am I the jerk for overruling my wife on a matter concerning our daughter? I, 42 male, and my wife, 38 female, have a daughter who's 14. She's friends with the son, who is 13, of an acquaintance of mine. Because my daughter and her friend are different genders, my wife insists on always supervising their playdates. Our daughter can't go to his house. He has to come here. She always watches the kids when they're together and doesn't let them close the door when they're in her room. To be honest, I always thought my wife was being fairly reasonable until this incident. Kids are kids, and they're nearing the complicated age. So I always backed my wife up, even when my daughter begged to be allowed to go to her friend's house. Recently, my wife was watching the kids while I was at work and realized she needed some things from the store. She made the kids go with her so they wouldn't be alone. Apparently, I'm obviously getting all of this info secondhand, the kids wandered off while she was shopping. While they were alone, an employee approached my daughter's friend and accused him of stealing something. My daughter's friend turned out his jacket pockets and there was nothing in there but his phone and keys. The employee demanded that he remove his jacket because she thought something was hidden under the jacket. My daughter's friend refused and said he didn't steal anything. My daughter called for my wife and she showed up pretty quickly. My wife sided with the employee and asked my daughter's friend to remove the jacket. When he did, the employee saw the necklace he was wearing and demanded he take it off so she could inspect it to see if it was merchandise from the store. I've seen him wearing this necklace before for the record. At this point, he ran out of the store into the cold, not wearing a jacket, and called his grandfather to come pick him up. I was at work when my acquaintance called me, furious. He said his son was half frozen when his dad got to him, which I believe because it's very cold here right now, and that my wife had profiled him. He told me that his son won't be going over to my house ever again. Edit. My daughter wants me to add this. She, unlike me, knows how to use Reddit properly and edit posts. Her friend is mixed. A lot of people asked and I didn't know, so hopefully they see this. Edit 2. My wife texted me that there was an emergency and I needed to call her, so I stepped out of the theater and did so. Guess what? No emergency. No surprise either. She told me I had no right to separate her from her daughter on Christmas. I said it was her choice and confronted her about what my daughter said at breakfast, especially about the food thing. She started crying and said I had no idea what that boy put her through. I hung up. Forget this. It's Christmas. I'm watching Home Alone with my daughter. Edit 3. My daughter said this comment needs to be in the post itself. Yeah, the paying attention to the movie didn't last. She's become really intrigued by all these comments and has been on my phone for the last 20 minutes. I'm pasting it in. She showed me how. So my daughter and I are at the movies right now. After breakfast, she said she didn't want to go home so we're going to the Christmas movie marathon at the local theater. She went to get snacks. I gave her $30 so she could come back with a small tub of popcorn. Darn these concession prices. So I'm going to tell you guys some of what happened at breakfast. It was a lot, so apologies if some stuff seems rushed over. Ask for clarification if you'd like. My wife is blowing up my phone right now, but I don't want to talk to her. This wasn't the first time something like this happened, just the first time it happened in public. Here's some of the things my daughter told me my wife did that they kept quiet about for fear of not being allowed to hang out anymore. I know, I'm a jerk. I understand that. My wife screamed at this kid for giving my daughter a gymnastics lesson. He's on a gymnastics team. They weren't doing anything dangerous. She made them stop and called him names. She screamed at them for playing with makeup. It belonged to my daughter and was a gift from my sister. I don't think it was expensive stuff. Even if it was, who cares? She made him wash his face and go home. He told his grandfather he had a stomachache that day apparently. She told him he eats too much food at our house. This is the worst one for me. I was mad when she told me that. So yeah, learn some stuff about my wife. It's clear to me now that I haven't been an active member of my marriage in a long time. This was hard to learn. The hardest part was knowing that my daughter didn't trust me with any of this because she assumed I would side with her mom. Edit 4. I asked my daughter to stop reading this stuff on this post. Obviously, now that she's seen it, she can go on Reddit on her own phone and find it again. 
but trust has to start somewhere, right? We gave up on the Christmas marathon. We're both too upset to sit still and watch a movie. I took her to my sister's and then went home to talk to my wife. I needed to get some things straightened out with her before I took my daughter home. It didn't go well. My wife apologized when I got home. She was crying. She said the holidays were so stressful and that she had a bit of a breakdown. She begged me to get our daughter and bring her home. I said I would once we talked. She kept sobbing, so I went and got her some water. I said we could talk or I could leave, but I wasn't going to get our daughter until we talked. Eventually, she stopped crying and talked to me. I told her I want to go to family therapy and she agreed. I'm sitting in the living room now, calming down, before I go back to my sister's to get my daughter. That was extremely emotionally draining. What a way to spend Christmas morning. Not the jerk, but you still have some work to do. Firstly, you're absolutely right that your daughter should be allowed to visit her friend. If his grandfather is there, that sorts out the adult supervision line your wife is worried about. So all told, you're making a reasonable adjustment based on her wishes. Her failure to compromise isn't your fault. However, I think you already know that your wife is not setting a healthy example for your daughter at all. You said your daughter defended her friend. Good, that sort of prejudice needs to be called out. However, the enforced supervision, the you know what teens are like, is another matter. As others have said, this will only lead to resentment and mistakes. Far better that you ensure your daughter understands being safe and more importantly feels empowered to set her own boundaries and make her own decisions. Constant supervision on its own is authoritarian and doesn't work. You say you want to talk to your daughter about all this. Good. Make sure she knows that you trust her and she can come to you for advice, but that you're there to support her making the right decisions, not trying to make them for her. I'm not saying let her do whatever she wants, she's still only 13, but make sure she knows you respect her independence to make some choices of her own and that you'll still love and support her. I'm not saying you don't do any of these things at all, but make sure she knows, because from the sounds of it, currently your wife seems to be the leader on these issues and she is not setting a good example. Sister demands that I give her one of my twin babies and my mother backs her up. So I, 27 female, am an identical twin. Now there's this idea that twins, especially identical twins, have an automatic connection. Well, this is not true with us. Mostly because we grew up in different homes. At 13, our parents split and I chose to live with my dad and she chose to live with our mother. And she ended up taking on my mother's I'm better than everyone else and the world should bow down to me attitude. This attitude is a huge reason I chose to live with my dad. My mother cared a lot about appearance and what people thought, and because I wasn't a perfect kid, she treated me horribly. Well, my sister was her perfect girl and pretty much her personal mini-me. I wasn't. First, I went through a punk slash tomboy phase through middle school and into high school, which I still somewhat incorporate into my style and personality today. My sister was also pretty popular throughout high school. She had a lot of friends, and well, I had three friends. And guess what? I was considered a nerd. After our parents split, I would spend every first weekend with my mother and my sister, and my sister spent every second weekend with me and my dad. I stopped going to my mother's house when I was 15. I had started dating another girl from school. My mother accused me of just looking for attention. My relationship with her became strained after that. Well, flash forward seven years to when my sister and I were 22. My sister and her boyfriend were trying to have a baby, but they couldn't seem to get pregnant. After a year of trying, they found out that she's not physically able to have kids. Well, I felt bad for her, but I didn't think much of it as I thought there was nothing I could do to help. Turns out, my sister and mother thought differently. We were all at my aunt's house for her birthday when my sister and mother pulled me aside. Mother, so you know about your sister's doctor visit? Me, yeah, I'm so sorry. I know how much you wanted it. Mother, well, we actually figured out a way that she can have a baby. Me, is she going to adopt? Sister, no, we can't do that. It costs too much. Oh, well then what's your plan? Mother, I remembered something I saw online a while back, so I looked it up. And since you two are twins, if you have a baby, she will be just as biologically related to it as if she had one herself. Me, wait. You want me to get pregnant and carry the baby? Yes, it's a perfect situation. Me, that is not happening. OP, she is your sister and you can help her. Stop being so selfish. Me, I'm not being selfish. Getting pregnant is a big deal and it will take literally nine months of my life. I have a job. 
I had also just started a new relationship with a guy and getting pregnant would likely have made things awkward. And last but not least, I just didn't want to be pregnant. They started going in on me, on how I need to help my sister and trying to guilt trip me into doing it. I wasn't taking it and made it clear that it wasn't going to happen. I thought that was the end, but then a year later, despite all attempts to prevent it from happening, I got pregnant. My boyfriend at the time, who I had only been dating for a year and I wasn't sure what to do. We talked about it and all the options, but we decided to go through with the pregnancy. I kept my pregnancy secret for as long as I could, but once I started showing, I announced it online, which resulted in a call from my sister. Sister. So, you're pregnant? Me. Yeah. What happened in not wanting kids? Well, accidents happen, I guess. So, since you never wanted a kid, you could let us adopt it. Me. What? Well, you always said you never wanted kids, and this one was an accident, so you should let us adopt it. <laughs> no, not happening. This is me and my boyfriend's baby, and we're going to raise it. But you said you didn't want kids. Well, I changed my mind. It happens. That's not fair. I hung up on her after that. I wasn't in any mood to fight. She then tried to get my mom to guilt trip me into giving her the baby. And despite my reminder that even if I didn't want the baby, I couldn't just give it to them as my boyfriend was the father and he had rights to the kid. They didn't seem to understand. Now if you thought it ended there, nope. Well, when we went in for a checkup, I found out that I was having twins, which in a way wasn't a big surprise since being a twin myself gave me a higher chance at having them. I took a while to come to terms with having one baby, so finding out I was going to have two was a huge shock. I was still pretty freaked out about having twins, but decided to announce it, which resulted in another call from my sister. You're having twins? Yeah, apparently. Ironic, right? So, can I have one? What? Since you're having twins, I can have one. No, you can't. Why not? You have two. Yeah, I am having to. They are my babies, and me and my boyfriend will be raising both. But that's not fair. I hung up again as I wasn't going to fight her. But then my mother calls me, and this is the conversation. Mother, your sister just called me crying. Okay. Can't you just give her one of them? You know how much she wants a baby. Me, that's not my problem. These are my kids. She can always adopt. There are plenty of kids looking for homes. OP, why do you always have to be so difficult and selfish? You never even wanted these kids in the first place. Would it hurt you to give one to your sister? Me, this is ridiculous. She's not getting either of my babies. After some more attempting at guilt tripping me, they finally stopped demanding I give them a baby. But that didn't stop them from overstepping with the kids on multiple occasions. Context, it's been a few years now and the boys are about to turn five. Over the last few years, I had to fight with my mother and sister about some weird and honestly disrespectful stuff that they've done. Maybe I'll share more of these stories here too. Depends on if anyone in my family finds this one or not. Edit. I should have added this in the beginning. I have low to no contact with my sister and mother as of now. I live very far from them. Our contact is purely social media. Facebook. Am I the jerk for leaving my husband for a Christmas trip to Hawaii with our kids? Every year, my family spends our Christmas in Hawaii. We've done it every year since I can remember, and it's a fun family tradition for me. After me and my husband had kids, we had to reorganize our family Christmas plans because his parents wanted to see our kids for Christmas. So we decided that we would celebrate Christmas with his parents on New Year's and go to Hawaii for actual Christmas. This is the system that worked for us until last year. Last year, his dad passed around this time of the year, and it hit him and his mom hard. For obvious reasons, we didn't go to Hawaii. This year, we planned out what we'd do for the holidays early. We'd do Thanksgiving with his mom, and we'd do Christmas in Hawaii, since me and the kids missed out last year. Things were going well until right before our flight. About a week out, he said he was unsure. He said that he thinks it might be better that we stay. He said he really wanted to spend Christmas with his family and felt like his mom really needed it. I was unhappy about this. We made a plan, we saw her last month, and we already had my dad buy our tickets and hotel, so it would be incredibly unfair to me, him, and our kids for us to just not go for his mom, who we'd see again in a few days after we got back anyways. We got into an argument about it and proposed that me and the kids can go to Hawaii and he can stay there with his mom. 
He decided to do this, but he was very clearly upset that I wasn't going to forego my family's Christmas tradition and seeing my family just for his mom. So now I'm in Hawaii, watching and wrangling the kids by myself while he's home alone. He hasn't texted me or responded to me much. When I call him, he only talks for about three minutes before wanting to get off the phone with me and talk to the girls. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, because you stayed home the first year after his dad passed and you had agreed to the Thanksgiving and Christmas arrangement for this year. He changed his mind after all the arrangements were made. However, I think you and your husband need to talk about this more. Where are he and his mom in their grieving processes? How does he envision things working in future years? Does he want every Christmas with his mom now? Does he want to do alternate Christmases? Or is this year just particularly hard for both of them? Also, is there an option to have your mother-in-law join you in Hawaii since she's on her own? No jerks here. I feel for your husband. He lost his dad a year ago and his mom is spending Christmas without her partner. With plane tickets bought and hotels arranged, a week out is not enough time to change plans. I agree with you about not wanting to cancel and taking the kids to see your family. I do think you need to cut him some slack here though. The holidays can be really hard for people who have lost loved ones recently. I think you're all doing your best in this situation and I don't think there is any right answer here. Hopefully your husband can join you next year and maybe you could have a conversation about that when you get back. Info. Why not just bring his mom to Hawaii? OP doesn't pay for it. Yes, it would be rude to ask her parents to cover mother-in-law. OP and her husband should have covered the cost for mother-in-law to go to Hawaii with them. Maybe they aren't financially comfortable enough to do so. Maybe, but a family that can afford an annual trip to Hawaii sounds like there's enough lying around for one extra domestic plane ticket. Or split it. Mother-in-law may have financial ability. Moreover, Christmas at home generally will cost half of an airline ticket anyway. There's accommodation already paid for on the other side. You're the jerk for this. After me and my husband had kids, we had to reorganize our family Christmas plans because his parents wanted to see our kids for Christmas, so we decided that we would celebrate Christmas with his parents on New Year's and go to Hawaii for actual Christmas. What part exactly did you reorganize? You still kept going to Hawaii every year. It was your husband's parents who changed their Christmas celebration to New Year. Obviously, husband shouldn't have waited till after the tickets were bought before voicing his concerns, but it really doesn't sound like it would have made a difference. You make it sound like your father-in-law passing away last year was just an inconvenience that kept you from going to your trip and you're failing to show your husband any empathy. You're just thinking about yourself. You're the jerk. I'm honestly shocked that you guys would even plan for Hawaii this year. How much of this was his idea and not just your urging? He didn't lose his dad months before Christmas last year. He basically lost him and laid him to rest during Christmas. And it didn't occur that this year may be hard for him and his mother? That he might not be in an aloha spirit? That his mom might not want her son and grandbabies to be gone while she mourns for her husband? You do Hawaii every year. This is the first. I don't care how hard you argue that it's his second and that he should be fine. Holiday season without his dad. It's the anniversary of his dad passing. You were wrong for even booking the tickets and not saying, hey honey, this could be a tough one. Let's just spend Christmas at home with your mom and maybe we can all do Hawaii next year. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. My brother is accusing me of ruining Christmas after I told his wife the truth about a family name. I can't figure out if I did anything wrong or if so, what? Because I honestly have no idea what's going on. Hopefully someone here can give me a clue. Here's the relevant info as far as I know. My brother and his wife are expecting their first girl after two boys. I love Ricky and Jace, and so does my sister-in-law, but she has always wanted a girl and is very excited to be having one. She also wants to name the girl Chloe, as she loves that name. My brother hates the name Chloe and really wants to name their daughter Stephanie. They've been arguing about it for a few weeks since finding out the gender. I got to my parents' house late last night, and my sister-in-law was the only person still awake. We talked for a little bit and she asked me the weirdest question. She asked me if I knew any stories about Great Aunt Stephanie. I was so confused. I literally said, who? Sister-in-law clarified that she was talking about our grandmother's older sister that passed when grandma was still little. Our grandma had two sisters, but their names were Judy and Lynn. There's no one in our family named Stephanie, as far as I know. I told as much to my sister-in-law, and she changed the subject after that, and we soon went to bed. 
This morning, my brother and his wife were both sulking during breakfast. Even the kids could tell. Ricky kept saying, stop being grumpy on Christmas. So it wasn't just my imagination. I got my brother alone and confronted him. He snapped at me for meddling and told me to stay out of his marriage. My brother is upset at me and my sister-in-law won't even talk to me. I'm afraid to say anything to my parents and drag them into this, especially since I still don't know what this is. Either my grandmother had a secret sister that I don't know about, but my brother does for some reason, or my brother lied to his wife to convince her to name their baby Stephanie. Both options seem equally weird to me. Maybe there's a third possibility I'm not seeing. Reddit, am I the jerk? If so, please explain to me why. I don't want to be the reason Christmas is ruined. Update. Most awkward Christmas Eve dinner ever. Gotta keep this short, a lot going on. Everyone now knows what my brother was doing and the kids' names. Except the kids, obviously. They are upset. Weirdly, my mom is the most upset. A Christmas truce is in place for the kids, so no fighting on the holiday. However, the baby is definitely going to be named Chloe. My brother very quickly backed down when my mom said some few choice words to him. The topic is completely banned for the rest of festivities, so for now at least, they've tied a bow on the situation. Christmas morning update. Aside from some glaring over a couple of the boys' stocking stuffers, Robin Funko Pops, everything went well with the gift opening, as well as being woken up at 5.30 a.m. by being jumped on by one nephew's can. I think my brother realizes he crossed a line and has been very attentive to his wife. He mentioned getting Chloe's name embroidered on some stuff when they get home. He even told mom he would do the Christmas breakfast so she could have a break and he gave me an I'm sorry grin when I opened his gift. I think everything is going to be fine. Not the jerk. You cannot be expected to maintain lies you are not aware of if you even view maintaining convenient lies as one of your duties in the first place. Way too many of these questions are because some relative refused to lie to another relative or just didn't know that a lie exists. Not the jerk. I don't know why your sister-in-law is not talking to you. She asked a question and you answered honestly. And your brother either lied to you or lied to her. He's the jerk here. You didn't meddle. You brought the conversation up organically. Complain to whomever I want? You bet. The last school year has been challenging for me at work. I'm an English high school teacher, not in the US, and the work environment at that school has been going from bad to worse as the school year progressed. Our principal has created a very hostile and toxic work and learning environment that has made many young teachers leave, even at the start and middle of the year, very uncommon in my country. I, 32, male, and many of the other teachers have felt bullied and oppressed. Our complaints went unheard and ridiculed, with the principal targeting many of us, young and experienced teachers alike, for public shaming sessions. And my turn came last week. I asked for a meeting with her to discuss my desire to go back to university next year to complete my thesis, which would have resulted in me taking Tuesdays off. All teachers in my country get a day off, which is usually for us to choose. As soon as I walked in, she called one of the administrators, and they both started a 30-minute shaming session. I was told that I'm a lousy teacher, my classes are boring, they never attended any of my classes, that I've conspired to ruin English teaching at our school, and that students, parents, other teachers, and administrators have been complaining about me. She wants teachers to work full-time, which she knows I planned on doing anyway and have been asking for it for two years, and advised me to take a break from teaching, unpaid leave. I was shocked and speechless. In my three years at that school, I received only praise from everyone I worked with. My students, their parents, and colleagues love me, to which I have written proof. The following day, I went ahead and turned in my notice. She called me a liar. I told other teachers what happened as they saw me coming out pale and on the verge of tears out of her office and said that I couldn't take criticism. She has also started lying about me to her colleagues and other school principals. They all know me and told me. She also told me to complain to whomever I want. Cue malicious compliance. Following excellent advice I got on Am I the Jerk, I waited to file the complaint until I secured a new position. However, I decided to follow that last bit of advice from her. I sent it to whomever I thought might be interested, the regional general inspectorate, the teachers union, and other officials, an inspector I knew in my country's ministry of education, and the best part, every teaching college and program in a 200 kilometer radius, which included the most prominent and largest education programs in my country and area. Fallout. 
The principal had to beg the ministry to send them new teachers, as quite a few of us left at the end of last year. Most of the poor English teachers she did get contacted me via mutual friends and colleagues asking me for help getting new positions as the work environment has only gotten worse, a request to which I gladly obliged. The complaint itself didn't impact the principal professionally, but she will have a pretty difficult time filling positions for the next few years. A few colleagues from that school will join me next year as they kept calling me to vent about the worsening conditions there, so I just told them to send me their CVs, which my coordinator was more than happy to receive. As for me, I found a wonderful school outside of my city where I could rediscover my love of teaching. Not only have I found a place where I feel good, but I also found a second job. I now teach at my local college, where the hourly rate is five times my school salary. I've also found the courage to start something I always wanted to do, move to another country, which I'm on track to do in 2024. Was I wrong to file a police report on my neighbor? Tonight, a bunch of my neighbors called me out to tell me that my car had been sideswiped, along with another car in front of me. They saw the car leave. I thought I had no other option than to call it into my own insurance in the morning. Then some other neighbors came out and pointed at another car down the street parked in front of a neighbor. They said it was that car that hit mine. I walk down there and there's a party on the front lawn. I see the car and the damage to the front and I ask them who the car belongs to and if they saw the accident. They all said no. It was apparently really loud and the whole street heard it happen. Then as I'm inspecting the damaged car, the neighbor finally comes out and says, we will take care of it. And I was like, take care of what? He said it was his car and I asked who was driving and if I could talk to whoever was driving. He said the guy wasn't there and proceeded to say he'll come see me in the morning and take care of it. I said fine and walked back, but my neighbors were still congregating and said I needed to file a police report if I can't get any information from the guy. I went back and talked to the guy and explained I really need the info or at least to meet the guy that was driving or I need to file a report and I really didn't want to do that but I needed something. He kept saying I should trust him and I told him it's not that I don't want to trust him but it also doesn't help that he denied it when I initially asked and only came forward when I found his car. I said I wasn't angry, I just wanted to know what had happened. He said it was some young guys in the house but he didn't want to go interrogate. I ended up calling the police to file a report and he and his wife came out when the police came and said it was his wife that was driving and didn't want to confess because she was scared. I felt so terrible for calling the cops because I see this neighbor all the time. We don't speak, but we do say hi. I told my father afterward and he said I did the right thing because they could deny it in the morning or the suspect car could be gone. He said if they were honest people, they should have confessed in the beginning when he saw people coming out of their house to see what had happened. Also turns out the car in front of mine that got damaged belonged to one of their guests. Mine has door damage and a missing mirror, but theirs was in the back corner and wheel and it seemed like it would be a totaled car. But I still feel guilty. Did I jump the gun by filing a police report? Not the jerk. They were messing you around, hoping you'd just go away and foot the bill for their DUI. Forget that. Calling the police was the right thing to do. Absolutely. I mean, come on, she was scared? Of course you're scared when you sideswipe somebody, but you're a grown adult. You did significant damage in front of an entire street of your neighbors. You don't hide and pretend like nothing happened. You're not 13. You know better than that. And an entire party and her husband playing along and denying it like this is high school and you're trying to make up a fake story for the principal. OP, do not feel bad because they're your neighbors and you see them all the time. You are their neighbor and they were willing to sideswipe your car, not say anything to you, and then lie to your face when confronted. Don't waste mental energy having more regard for them than they have for you. Come on, sideswiping two cars on a residential street and doing so much damage, one of them could have been described as totaled. That's either drunk or texting. Either way, it's careless driving. What if a kid had been playing? And it's not like you went over there just to shame her. You went over there and called the cops to make sure you were covered for the damage she did. If she feels ashamed, which she should, that's just a byproduct of having made a huge mistake. How I got our workshop repaired and revenge on my manager. So I know what people are going to say. If it was dangerous, why not just report it to health and safety? And my answer to that is that I am as thick as mints. Plus, I've seen how they butchered the workshop of another department, putting insane safety measures in place that do little to actually protect people, 
and mostly just get in the way. The safety person is only technically qualified, meaning they're office workers that went on a course about it once. Go figure. So the situation was, I was working in a machining workshop, mill, lathe, surface grinder, etc. And it's old, old and worn out. Everything needs maintenance, but either management don't give us the time, it needs new parts that management won't buy, or it needs a proper service from a professional that management won't get in. Then someone in health and safety asks about safety checks, which the manager in charge sheepishly mentions there are none. Officially at least, we have the sense to do them anyway. And so weekly safety checks are put in place. More paperwork, oh, but I don't mind. Knowing this manager, he expects them done like all other safety checks in the factory, unless it's going to hurt someone, sign to say it's okay anyway, and let him know so it can be fixed later. That way the machines don't get stopped constantly. But I realize the potential. Want me to do the checks? Sure, I'll do the checks perfectly. Spindle break on the lathe is worn out? Fail, locked off. Nobody can use it until it's fixed. No emergency stop on the big drill? Fail, locked off. Nobody can use it. Plastic housing for the wiring on the mill is broken? Fail, locked off. Nobody can use it, etc, etc. Safe to say, he wasn't happy. But what can he do? It's all recorded on paper and machines in the factory are stopping because they need parts making. Then came the big one. For a while, we've noticed machines getting damaged overnight. Night shift. But we weren't sure how. All the machines are on key locks and we have the only keys. I came back after break one day and find a machine operator turning on a bench grinder to sharpen a knife. Cue some colorful words about what he thinks he's doing, why it's wrong, what I'll do to him if he does it again and I ask how he turned it on. Turns out someone from night shift told him the lock is old and worn out and basically any similar key will work just fine, no matter what the bidding. So I go around to check and sure enough my locker key, the kind everyone in the factory has, turns on every machine. Some even worked with a screwdriver or just using the back of another key because there was no lock left inside. Fail, 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 fail. Everything fails. Whole workshop stopped. If this was a cartoon, the manager's ears would be leaking steam by now. He insists that this doesn't count as a fail because reasons. Then that these locks with keys that control power aren't keyed interlocks and so I don't need to check them before finally just insisting it's okay and I should pass it because he says so. Sure, I said. Just put it in writing that it's you saying it's okay, not me. Sure back down quick then. A day or so later, new locks turned up and were fitted and the problem of overnight broken equipment went away. In the end, the manager got an earful from his bosses about production delays and another from health and safety when they found out these issues had been reported for a long time without anything done about them. In all though, he got away pretty clean besides the bruised ego. And that's how the workshop went from old, crappy and dangerous to just old and slightly less crappy. Oh, I'll just hold on to it. Leave it. It's fine. Not sure how many of you folks have dogs, specifically male dogs, but for anyone who doesn't, pro tip, anything upright and stationary can and will be peed on. Fire hydrants? Of course. Signs? Absolutely. Plants? You bet. Innocent bystanders who haven't moved recently? Uh, oops. I swear that's only happened twice. One fine day about two years or so ago, my pupper and I were at the dog park, doing dog park things. I throw the ball, he chases it down. Sometimes he'll bring it back, sometimes he'll leave it random places. Sometimes he'll bring it to a random stranger in the park and look at them like they're soft until they figure out he wants them to throw the ball. The entire time this is happening, the whole park is getting all the p-mails replied to, one spritz at a time. This particular time, we had the entire dog park to ourselves for a little while, and these two ladies come in with super cute beagle puppies. One woman sensibly didn't bring a bag with her into the park. She had pockets. The other lady had a very big bag, and it looked like it cost about as much as a used car. This was the kind where she'll get scoliosis from carting the thing around, but it's large enough to fit actual care and appliances. So these two ladies are standing there talking to each other and monitoring their puppies, which is good. I've more or less dissolved into a puddle of aww, and my dog makes friends because at that time in his life, he'd still play with other dogs. Then I notice the woman with the bag has put her bag on the ground, 
which is the thing you do when you've probably got a car battery crammed in there with all the other stuff ladies need to carry when they're not permitted pockets by the cruel gods of fashion. I notice this and figure she's new. Once I've recollected myself from puddle form, I wait for an opportune moment and toss out an, excuse me, I hate to interrupt, but I just wanted to let you know that having your bag on the ground is a bad idea at the dog park. I've seen others hang it on the chain link fence, and I point at the fence that encloses the dog park. Not like there weren't over 9,000 available hangers for her bag. They both look at me in mild shock. Apparently, they hadn't noticed me gushing all over their cute puppies. Then they caught on to what I was saying, and the sensible lady looks at her friend and rolls her eyes, while the bag lady comes back with, Oh, I'll just hold on to it, and picks up the bagzilla and slings it back over her shoulder. I shrug and buzz off, which was not a stated request, but was implied. Within five minutes, the doom bag is back on the ground, and I meander over, because I see my dog go into a target lock mode. The stream is imminent. I attempt to give the woman a heads up, and make it as far as, uh, bag lady looks at me and just snaps. Leave it, it'll be fine. I give her a shrug and mosey over to somewhere clear of the blast radius. Not only does my dog have target lock, he's also parked himself uphill from the bag's impact crater. His leg lifts, and it's no spritz going into, not onto, her bag. It's a full stream. Realizing the most likely reaction from bag lady is a designer boot to somewhere, I shout, Dexter, no, at max volume, and get the desired result. He looks at me, and then doesn't escape, and evades, because he's a jerk like that sometimes. Both ladies look at me, then at the bag, and then at the dog. Sensible lady is fighting back tears, while bag lady works herself up into a frenzy. How dare my filthy animal urinate on her valuable stuff? Don't I have him trained? Blah blah blah. She scruffs her puppy and holds him in her arms, while maintaining a constant stream of castigation at me. It was honestly kind of impressive. Keep shouting at me all the way over to her car, throws the puppy in, hope he's okay, and burns rubber leaving the park. Other lady bursts out laughing once the car is out of line of sight. She wheezes. At least you tried. How dare you stand near me? I work as a self-checkout clerk. It's my job to stand near the registers and make sure people don't steal stuff and make sure any issues they have with our point of sale system get smoothed over. Because of what's going on, I also sanitize these registers. Late last night, I was doing just that when two women came up to the register I was trying to clean. I moved off a bit until I noticed that the receipt wasn't printing after she put in her money and went over to investigate. It said she still had $1.14 left to pay. She asked me why it wasn't printing and I told her that before moving away. I stayed nearby because I still needed to clean the register. Are you staying here to make sure I don't steal a dollar and 14 cents? No, I just wanted to sanitize the register because sometimes people are gross. Since it's what I have to do next, I just want to stick around. You know we come through self-checkout to avoid people. I internally rolled my eyes. She paid and she left without her friend. Her friend had grabbed some food from the deli and decided she didn't want it. So I handed it off to another associate to return and went back to monitoring the area. A woman needed help scanning produce because it can be a pain in the butt on our system, stuff like that. I go back to the register I saw her at to get back my cleaner and paper towels and notice that there are still two items on the belt that haven't been scanned. Oh, are you going to pay for those in a separate transaction or do you not want them? Well, I was going to pay for them in a separate transaction, but since you've been harassing me all night, I don't want them anymore. Ma'am, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention. I was just trying to clean... You've been acting like I was planning on stealing these. I'm going to call and make sure your manager hears about this tomorrow. She picked up the two things that were still on the belt and threw them at me. Not very hard, and they were light, but it surprised me. Ma'am, I'm so sorry. If you want to talk with... Now you're trying to embarrass me in front of everyone to keep me from telling him what you did. I'm just trying to understand what I did so that I don't do it again. She grabbed the things she did pay for and left me with the super glue and electrical tape. My cousin is pregnant and none of us are happy about it. I'm 31 female and my younger cousin, who's 28, recently found out that she's pregnant. She's really excited, but she found out that she's having triplets. The dad, who's 45, is a real piece of work and he won't even be in the picture and he can't offer financial support either. She doesn't make very much money and she has no savings. I myself have two kids 
and even with the financial and emotional support of my partner, it can be very stressful. Over the past few weeks, I've gently tried to tell her that it may not be a green pasture ahead. She doesn't even have a functional car right now. It's like her head is stuck in the sand and she's only talking about how amazing it will be, how blessed she is, how it's a miracle, how she'll just figure it out. On Christmas Eve, she surprised the rest of the family with the news after doing a big surprise scavenger hunt that led to three onesies. Her mom already knew, but she told grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc. She didn't get the reaction that she was hoping for. Some people told her she should consider her options. Some talked to her about how hard this will be, asked about how she will afford this, wanted to know what support the dad would be giving, etc. It was not very celebratory. I could tell she was upset and she left early. I went to talk to her this morning in her studio apartment. I told her I was sorry for everyone's reaction, but that I could see where the family was coming from and that they just wanted what was best for her and were concerned. I asked her what she expected the reaction to be and she told me she thought everyone would rally together to help her now and to offer a bunch of help once the babies arrived. She expected financial support too. I told her that she can't rely on others like that and she will likely have to figure a lot of this out on her own if she goes through with it. She told me that I'm horrible, that our family is terrible, and that we all deserve each other, and that unless she gets our support, she'll cut us all out. Then she told me to leave. In some ways, I think it's a reality check, but the more I think about it, I also know how overwhelming it is to be pregnant, and I'm sorry that she didn't get any happy reactions or offers of support especially because in the past, other family members have gotten very happy family reactions when sharing their pregnancies. Am I the jerk for agreeing with the rest of our family? You're the jerk, and most of your family is too. She's obviously happy about the pregnancy and wants those kids. Suggesting, considering her options, when she shares the news is vile. All of you could have shared your concerns in a much more supportive and sensible way. You're the jerk. You and your delusional family have no right whatsoever to determine whether or not your cousin gets to have her babies. That is her choice and hers alone. I can't imagine how heartbreaking it must have been for her to have you monsters show her absolutely zero affection whatsoever when she shares the greatest joy one can imagine with you. Regardless of what you think, she has been blessed and the Lord has a plan for these babies. She doesn't need you or anyone else's approval in order to have them. Not the jerk. I'm not surprised that these comments are tearing into you. You're speaking a language that Reddit doesn't understand. It's called common sense. She doesn't have an income, a car, or a partner who will even be in the picture, but expects to have triplets and be able to raise them? Another fine example of how truly unintelligent the people on Reddit are to claim that she's in the right and you and your family are in the wrong. We live in a world where speaking common sense will paint you as the bad guy, and people wonder why everything is only getting worse and will continue to do so. If anyone knows a country where the people have common sense, please let me know so I can move there. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP and their family or their cousin? Please let us know. If she cuts all of you out of her life, sounds like it'll be a win for you to be honest. Sounds like she plans to be a leech the rest of her life. My parents call me out at Christmas dinner for living with my fiance before marriage. Okay. Two can play this game. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm the primary care provider for a lot of the low-risk maternity cases at the practice where I work. I also work hand-in-hand -hand with the doctors and midwives to create a healthy maternity, birth, and postpartum situation. My fiancé is completing her residency. We live together and have for a few years now. We aren't in any hurry to get married. We originally had plans to do so a couple of years ago, but then we got really busy for two years. It's driving my very religious parents crazy that their youngest son is living in sin. I don't really care. I'm an adult and I do what I want. We're getting married in June. So we're visiting my parents for Christmas. The way it came together this year, everyone is at my parents' house. So that's my folks, my three siblings, myself and fiance, and seven grandkids. So 17 people. At dinner, my mom starts going on about how she's so glad that we're finally getting married and she won't be embarrassed at church anymore. And my dad says how proud he is of his three older kids who all either waited to get married before moving in together or got married right away after moving in together. My fiance was getting embarrassed and I was getting mad over this stupid argument we have had too many times and a family dinner was the last straw. 
I've asked them repeatedly to just accept that they cannot control how I live my life. I refuse to stay with them when I visit, even if I come alone. Hotels are just easier. So I started talking about a premature baby I had been reading about. It was almost three months premature and weighed about 1.6 pounds. It was super strong and healthy for being born so little and the NICU had high hopes for the baby doing well. My mom and dad both got deer in the headlights looks on their faces. Too bad, shouldn't have messed around with my fiance's feelings. So I asked my oldest brother, he was born almost four months premature. Is there a chance that we could check out the family album where we keep all the records of family births and stuff? I already know my brother was over 9 pounds and almost 23 inches long when he was born. My grandmother told me about it the first time my parents tried to shame me. The subject gets changed very fast. After supper, my parents told me that I should not have tried to embarrass them with private things that are not my concern. I told them that if I heard anything about my living arrangements ever again for the rest of my life, I would make sure to keep bringing up the fact that my mom was in her second trimester when they got married. My parents are mad at me for telling them how to behave in their own home, but my fiancé is happy that they seem to be off the subject for good. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. That was beautifully handled. You didn't call them out and embarrass them, but you stood your ground. I did laugh out loud when you said where you got your blackmail information. Grandma had that in her pocket for a long time, I'm guessing. Congratulations on your upcoming wedding, Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a great new year. Not the jerk. I absolutely love this. My own judgy grandmother pretended to be oh so moral in the old fashioned sense. My father accidentally revealed that she was pregnant when she got married to my grandfather. That was incorrect. She wasn't pregnant at all. My oldest uncle was about seven months old when they got married. And why they couldn't get married sooner? My grandfather had to get divorced from his first wife first. It's often the people with the most things to hide who enjoy judging others for things that are none of their business. Am I the jerk for buying my niece a $4,000 gift for Christmas? I happen to marry into a family with an insane amount of money, more than they know what to do with, quite honestly. I spent approximately $15,000 per kid for my three kids for Christmas, which I am immensely grateful to be able to spend on them. I also donated the same amount to a charity of each kid's choice as well. My mom's side has a rule that we only get each other Christmas gifts if we will be seeing each other that year on Christmas Day. For cousins with kids, we get the kids' gifts rather than their parents. My mother hosted this year and about 10 of my cousins and their kids were coming. I bought each of my cousin's kids something unique, not really thinking about the price, but more what I thought that they would like. My cousin, 35, male, has a 14-year-old daughter. She's the result of a random hookup, so most of us in the family have only met her mother a handful of times and only for a few minutes. My daughter is also 14, and two parts of her Christmas Day gifts were a Cartier love ring and a YSL purse. I bought the same for my cousin's daughter, as they are very close in age and I thought that she'd really like it. My cousin's daughter excitedly FaceTimed her mother to show her the gifts that I had bought her and upon ending the FaceTime, her mother called my cousin and she was livid. She said that I spent more on her daughter for Christmas than she had and was livid with me. I genuinely didn't think about the cost of the gifts, just more what I thought that she would really like, especially considering I have a 14-year-old daughter myself and I know what they like. My cousin's daughter's mother is really upset with me because she feels that I made her look bad to her own daughter, but I only ever intended on getting her daughter gifts that I thought she'd like. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Most 14-year-olds don't dream of YSL purses and Cartier bracelets. I think the money has gone to your head and you just don't live in the real world anymore. What's normal to you and your husband's family is not normal for the majority of the world. I spent $15,000 on each of my three kids and donated the same amount to charity. Who spends $90,000 at Christmas? Even if I had it, I wouldn't. People who can afford to? Why is that an issue here? Because Reddit hates people that they're jealous of. I'd love to have gotten a YSL purse at 14 and happy to be able to help out at my favorite cause. But then some others get so jealous they have to resort to hate to put people down. Human nature is a funny thing. Or, get this, they hate the extreme wealth disparity that exists in many countries. Which is OP's fault, how? And giving equal amounts to helping others as she gives to her kids is literally helping mitigate that wealth gap. 
Or would you prefer she empties her bank account and house and gives it all away? Her husband's family success is not something she needs to apologize for. Honestly, people don't get into fortunes big enough that they can spend effortlessly $90,000 for Christmas gifts by being fair. They do that by exploiting workers, clients, environment, and or the law system. Because being a decent person is not profitable. And sure, OP probably has nothing to do with the cause of the fortune, but she profits off that exploit and people do have the right to be salty about it. And spending a bit of it on charity, which usually gets included in taxes anyway, does not make it even by no means. Not the jerk. I think you did a nice thing that was just a little extravagant and you unintentionally overshadowed her mother. I think her mother overreacted. It's not like you bought her a car or a puppy or something she needs to be responsible for. To be honest, I think a lot of the you're the jerk comments you're getting are from people who are quite jealous and annoyed that you have so much money to spend. I don't think you're malicious at all. I do think the money was excessive, but not enough for me to call you a jerk. So I'm going to vote not the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I kicked my family out on Christmas after what they said to my daughter. I, 48 female, and my husband, 48 male, have two kids, Randy, who's 22, and Eve, who's 19. Eve was diagnosed with autism when she was in elementary school. She does school online currently and can do some pretty basic tasks by herself, but me and my husband have to do a lot for her, cook for her, drive her places, etc. She recently started doing her own laundry, which we're very proud of, but it took like four years of learning and encouragement. We love her and we know we'll have to care for her. Eve loves toys. She especially likes dolls and little interactive animal toys. For Christmas, we had my parents, my two sisters and their husbands, my one sister's 15-year-old daughter and my mom's sister and her husband. Randy got a few games he wanted, plus a new laptop he needs for his classes next semester. Eve got dolls, a small dollhouse, some pajamas, some stuffed animals, and the big gift was an interactive horse toy that you can braid the hair of and things. Eve was overjoyed and played with it up until it was time for lunch. I didn't notice anything before, but at lunch, my mom was looking over at my sister, Brianna, and her daughter, Marissa, like they had done something wrong. I helped my daughter get a plate of food, got her a juice box, and went to go get my own food. I then heard yelling and my daughter crying and went back to the table. Turns out, Marissa had told Eve she's childish and shouldn't want toys anymore and needs to grow up, and my sisters both agreed. Marissa told her that she should be braiding her own hair instead of a toy's fake hair and make herself pretty instead of making a toy pretty. My mom and my father were horrified, and they had apparently heard Marissa and Brianna express this earlier and told them that they were being insensitive and will be in trouble if they tell me, my husband, or Eve that. Randy, the great brother he is, took Eve away from the situation and up to her room to calm down. I, as calmly as possible, explained for the millionth time that Eve is autistic. Her brain works differently, and if you were with her daily, you would see that her toys actually help her learn social skills, regulate her emotions, and calm her down. Brianna then said that I baby her too much. We make meals for her, get her food, buy her toys, and drive her everywhere, when we should just force her to learn on her own. Brianna said that because she does school, she's normal enough to live on her own, the exact words. I told Brianna, Marissa, and Brianna's husband to leave. My other sister and her husband tried to defend them, saying that if I just cut the cord, Eve would learn how to survive. I told them to leave too. My husband is with me, as is my father, but my mother said I took it too far by kicking them out and saying I'm never letting them around Eve again. They really hurt Eve. Luckily, she's still playing with her toys, so they didn't seem to ruin her love of them, but she's been sad and crying all day. I just put her to bed and started crying myself once she wasn't able to see me do it. Am I the jerk? I got Eve her food because she has pretty severe motor delays. She's about on the level of a five-year-old. Normally, I try to let her get her own food, and if she makes a mess, I clean it up. But since there were platters of food, think buffet style on a kitchen counter, that if she spilled, it would make a hazard on the kitchen floor where other people could slip. And my mom has had two knee replacements, so if she slips, that would have ruined Christmas even more. Her making a mess while eating isn't a worry, because I can clean it later, and nobody is going to be walking under the table to slip on it. We've worked with specialists since Eve's diagnosis to figure out the right way to both care for and foster independence. 
From some testing last year, specialists believe that Eve is at the level of a four or five year old socially, five year old motor skills, and academically 14. The problem is, she doesn't appear to have the cognitive ability to apply what she learns in school to the real world. For example, Eve could read a book and identify a character as mean because they don't understand, but she can only understand that my sisters and her cousin are mean, but not really why. Her language fluctuates from nonverbal to verbal with the language capability of a two-year-old to verbal with the language capability of a five-year-old. Her academic ability is an outlier, but the specialists don't seem too alarmed by it, so we aren't either. Not the jerk. You're protecting your daughter. And hey, maybe by cutting the cord with your sister's family, you'll force them to learn some empathy. If any cords have to be cut, I'd be looking at the family before the daughter. They were cruel and thoughtless, and then they doubled down on it when you called it out. I'd have given them the boot too. OP did the right thing to protect her daughter. Am I the jerk for giving my wife's Christmas present to my sister? I'm 44, male. My wife is 39, female, and my sister is also 39, female. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I'm using my second account because my real account has my wife. This below part is just a background on why my sister lives with us at the moment. My sister is back with us at the moment and has been living with us since October because of an ongoing divorce with her husband. My wife was not a fan of this and wanted my sister out and told me to give our other accommodation which we own to my sister while she settles for divorce. But my sister wants to live with us as she gets lonely and won't have anyone to cook for her because this whole thing is stressing her out. My wife has left our business because of a broken leg so she can help with the cooking for my sister. Since the start of the year, my wife has been wanting a Dyson Air thing for her hair. I don't get the excitement. And yes, I bought her the gift in November for Christmas and I wrapped it and put it in our garage. A few days ago, my sister was wrapping gifts for Christmas and asked me what I got for my wife. I told her it's a Dyson hair product and a Gucci perfume, around 700 pounds in total. My sister got excited for my wife, but sad again and said that she wanted a Dyson hair product too and used to beg her husband to buy it for her, but he never did. Apparently, he gifted the Dyson to his now girlfriend. This obviously made me mad, so I wanted to buy her another Dyson hair product, the same as my wife. I also had wrapped shoes for my sister for Christmas. I went to different stores, but it was sold out. Just my luck. I looked online, and it would only be delivered after Christmas. Because there was no option for my sister, I just removed the name sticker and put my sister's name on the Dyson that I bought for my wife and I gave it to my sister. Keep this in mind, I bought my wife extra Gucci perfume and she still got the gift. And yesterday, I gave everyone their gift and everyone was happy. Until my mom told me that she saw my wife's face during the gift giving and my wife looked hurt, apparently, and asked me why I didn't give my wife the Dyson instead. I thought she was happy with the perfume gift that I gave her. I told my mom the truth and my mother is calling me a jerk. My parents wanted to buy my wife Dyson hair product for Christmas but asked me before they bought it so I told them I was going to buy it for my wife. So they thought I'd actually give it to my wife and not change the plan last minute. Now my mom told our aunt too and she thinks I was the jerk too. I told them I will buy my wife the product again because we have plenty of time but they think it won't be the same as Christmas magic. So am I the jerk? Edit. My sister does not live with our parents because they live up north in Scottish Village. Us, we live in England and our business is in England and my sister works here and her work is 20 minute drive away from where we live. My wife can walk, she doesn't need crutches. The reason she left our business was because of a broken leg, but she's walkable, but she decided to rest after her cast was off. Obviously, you're the jerk. Think of it this way. Your sister wanted her husband to buy her something and he bought it but gave it to someone else. You think he's wrong for doing this. Your wife wanted you to buy her something and you bought it but gave it to someone else. What is wrong with you? Adding that on top of the fact that you've moved your sister into your home without your wife's approval and now you expect your wife to cook for your sister? She's a grown woman. She can cook for herself. And if your wife doesn't want her there, she should never have moved in. Why do you care more about your sister's feelings than your wife's? Even your own parents can see that you're being a bad husband. How are you this dense? You're the jerk, but thanks for explaining quite clearly why your sister got a divorce and why you'll get one soon too. You're the jerk 100% man. 
Putting your sister's wants and needs ahead of your wife's is inexcusable. You didn't want your sister to live by herself, so she had somebody to cook for her. Really? Am I the jerk for losing it on my sister over Christmas dinner because of her kids? I'm 35, male. Sister is 30. My kids are 7 and 9 and hers are 6 and 12. This year, we hosted Christmas dinner. I adore my sister and I adore my niece and nephew. They're good kids. We spend a lot of time together and our kids love playing together. However, her kids have this habit of digging into the food that's being served without it being on their plates. For example, once when we visited, my sister made mashed potatoes and both kids dipped their fingers into the pot and licked them, dipped again, etc. My kids never did this in their life. I don't have a problem with that. Her house, her rules. My wife and kids hate it though. So we were settling down at dinner. Almost all the guests had arrived. We had some light drinks and my wife and I brought out the first course which consisted of multiple things like cheese, grapes, ham, steamed veggies, meatballs, etc. on big platters so our guests can serve themselves with whatever they liked. As per usual, kids start going around the table to pick stuff from the platters. We laughed and cheered as they played around until I noticed that my niece and nephew were grabbing something, taking a bite and putting it back. My wife noticed it so she went discreetly around to get the stuff that they bit out off. I pulled my sister aside and told her to please tell her kids to stop doing that. In comes the next meal, which was a light soup with sour cream. The instant my wife put the serving bowl down, my niece and nephew grabbed the ladle and started to lick it. We kind of laughed nervously. My wife replaced the bowl and soup. Again, I told my sister to speak to her kids about it. Before the main course was served, my wife and I decided to just plate everything ourselves for each guest, which was a lot of work, but worth it. Again, niece and nephew immediately got up and started going around, dipping their fingers in random plates. At this point, my wife got a bit angry and told them aloud to wait patiently for their plates. Sister got irked. Guests started to get uncomfortable. Sister said, they're just kids. After an hour or so, we got out some chocolate cake. Niece and nephew literally put their hands in it before my wife got a chance to cut it. I saw her eyes started to get watery out of frustration and I blew up, yelled at my sister for not disciplining her kids and making everyone uncomfortable. My sister and brother-in-law got up and left. Several guests said that they found this gross, but mom and dad said that I should have spoken to my sister in private. Now I feel like a jerk. Not the jerk. Six is old enough to know better. The 12-year-old is too old to be doing that. Table manners are basic. Not the jerk. You went to their mom privately multiple times and nothing was done. It was upsetting your guests and your wife and the kids are definitely old enough to restrain themselves around company, especially if they're at someone else's house. Lose it on me and tell me to get a new job? Fine, I quit. Since my last story garnered some attention, I thought I'd post this one as well. Back when I used to work at McDonald's, they would treat me so terribly. I would work extremely hard with very little gratitude. I was only on $13 an hour at 15 to 16 years old, but even so, I had put my absolute all into what I did. I'd run stock, take orders over the headset while packing orders, I did the front, rush back up to the booth and cash the orders, etc. We were timed and my times would always be under the maximum limit, unless we were in a rush. I'd been working there for around 9 to 10 months at this point and slowly losing my sanity every single shift I did. The managers and staff were terrible, but the worst person was the store manager. She'd get angry at me for things that would be completely out of my control. If a customer changes their mind at the payment window, we need to get a manager to come in and give us a code to remove it from the screen. The managers would refuse to give us their codes to use during a rush, so they had to run up to my booth from the front to get rid of an item from an order. So many times I had customers change their minds at the window, and I'd ask over the headset for a code and my store manager would scream at me from down the front, then walk up to my booth and go off on me for making her use her code, saying, you need to learn to just take orders right, when it wouldn't even be my fault. She'd also scream at me if I accidentally brought down the wrong stock, or if I was too slow in getting stock. Usually I'd be busy cashing cars and taking orders during the busy rushes. She would even make me come into work on days I requested off due to my hip dysplasia or other back problems playing up, and she would threaten me with getting me fired if I didn't come into work, making me work through my pain so I wouldn't get much time to myself that wasn't just laying in bed at home in pain. So back to the story. 
After a very long 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. shift, I was up in the drive through booth at around 3.58 p.m., two minutes before my shift was over. We were dead, as we usually were at that time, and I was just kicking around waiting for my shift to end. I got a text from my mom asking if I needed picking up from work, so I took out my phone and texted back a simple, yes please, and put my phone away. At this point, it's important to mention that there was a camera in the top right corner of my booth, and if a manager looked, they could see what I was doing. Not even a second after I put my phone away, my store manager started to talk over the headset. Manager. Jazz, what are you doing right now? Me. Waiting for cars? Why? That's not a good way to use your time. How about you get off your phone and do what I pay you to do, or you can go get a different job? I was really upset. I started to cry, but was holding in tears because I didn't want to be seen. She had called me out over the headset, where everyone else in the store who was wearing a headset, everyone, could hear. To add some more clarity as to why I was so upset, there were three girls who were heavily favored, and they would often just sit in the crew room for sometimes up to an hour on their phones, and no one said anything to them. They were terrible workers too, but since they were favored, they got the best treatment. When it was time to clock out, I just left and started bawling my eyes out because of the embarrassment. I worked my butt off with no gratitude for months, but the second I text two words to my mom, I get scorned. My mom was worried and very angry. This is where my malicious compliance comes in. When I got home, I remembered what she said about finding a different job, so I wrote a very lovely email to the shift manager that went like this. Hi, shift manager. I've decided after a lot of thought that I will be resigning from my casual position effective immediately. I've had a few experiences over the past few months that haven't been very positive and I believe the best option for me is to resign. I appreciate and thank you for all the opportunities you've given me over the past year or so. Thanks heaps. Jazz. Ten minutes later, I got three phone calls from the store manager, but I wouldn't pick up. Then the shift manager also didn't pick up. I was absolutely fuming, so I did what she asked me to do. Find a new job. I was told by my best friend who was working at the same store that the store manager had been going around saying I called her terrible things and that I was a horrible little brat who wouldn't listen to her rules. I laughed and said, well, it's a good thing I'm not working there anymore then. While on my job hunt around two weeks later, I got a call from the shift manager saying that the store manager had been relocated, but later fired due to a staff complaint and wanted to know if I'd come back because of how good a staff member I was. Due to the lack of work at the time and needing money for teenager things, I went back and did the worst job I possibly could, basically just messing everyone around and being a lazy jerk. Edit. This was because I'd been called and asked to come back with promises that things had changed and the new store manager would be better. Being 16, I fell for the corporate talk and I went back, which resulted in them treating me even worse and even refused to give me the day off for my grandma's funeral. They messed me around, so I messed them around in return while looking for a new job. Then I quit again two months later for my current job at a Mexican place. The best part was that I put the store manager down as a reference and when my employer contacted her about me, she hung up the phone on them. I explained what happened, and we all laughed, and I got the job. Forget McDonald's. Karen steals my car on Christmas. I'm 16, female, and my dad's family comes from old money. His parents never approved of his relationship with my mother, and never did even when she got pregnant. He didn't see me for the first 10 years of my life until my grandparents passed away. Before that, when I was 7, my mother started to date Melissa, my stepmom, who has a daughter named Grace who's two years older than me. She used to be mean to me because she had a dad and I didn't. Things got worse when I found out that I did have a dad, he just wasn't around. Her dad had to intervene to make her stop bullying me. Three years after that, my dad contacted my mom, explained what happened and we reconnected. Grace's changed too because at the same time her dad started to distance from them until he ended up moving two states away to be closer to his new wife's family when I turned 13. I remember that during the first few years, if my dad bought me something, he'd buy something for Grace too. Not as big or meaningful, but he never left her out. She usually threw fits at Christmas because he would buy me tech. Phones, iPads, laptops, headphones, and only get her clothes. Pretty and good clothes to be honest. This Christmas was the worst though. Since Grace has to move for uni next year, her mom wanted to bring her grandparents, uncles, cousins, and dad to celebrate, 
so she asked me to spend New Year's with my dad this year, and I agreed to. My dad got here a few days ago to drop off our gifts, which included a brand new car because now that Grace is moving, she can't drive me around anymore. I was honestly so happy and excited. When Grace and her mom arrived and saw the car, they thought it was for her, from her dad or grandparents, because she's the one leaving for college. But my mom kindly explained to them that my dad had dropped it off for me. They weren't happy about this, but the day went on. They were excited about the small party for Grace. This morning, my mom and Grace were with Grandpa dropping some stuff off, so it was only my stepmom and I. Around 10 a.m., Grace's dad called and said that he wouldn't be able to make it and that he wished her luck before hanging up. It was really messed up. My stepmom was so mad, and when I asked what I could do, she said that she'll show me and started taking all of my presents from underneath the Christmas tree. I was so confused, and when she took my keys, I asked what she thought she was doing. She said, Grace doesn't need to feel like second best during this Christmas. I said that she couldn't take my things my dad gave me, and she only answered with a, I'm your mom, I can do whatever I want, and hopped in my car and left. I called my mom to tell her what happened, and after that I called my dad. He told my moms that if Melissa didn't give back my things, he'll report them as stolen, including my car, and while my mom is torn between us, Melissa and Grace said that I ruined Christmas because my stepmom might go to jail and that not everything is about me. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.